and Michael Remus. What is going on, Winnipeg and Manitoba? Welcome to a massive edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily coming off another memorable all-time sports day in the city of Winnipeg yesterday for Winnipeg Blue Bomber and Winnipeg Jet fans. Great to have you with us, Andrew Patterson, along with the returning Michael Remus. We'll get Remo in here in just a second and... uh, Man, we've got lots to talk about. Um, big comeback win for the Jets last night. And of course, the Bombers doing it again, beating the British Columbia Lions to book their ticket to the Grey Cup in Regina coming up next week. And I know many of you already, if you haven't, making plans to see if they can grab some tickets and see the Bombers go for the three-peat next week against Andrew Harris and the Toronto Argonauts. The stories pretty much write themselves. Um, we're going to get all over it. Looking forward to having Westy, Troy Westwood, join us. We'll spend most of the time, I'm sure, talking bombers, but also looking forward to get Westy's thoughts on the Jets' start to the season. And then Jeff Hamilton of the Winnipeg Free Press as well, um, kind of hitting both topics. Uh, of course, the Jets, busy weekend after three days off heading in and another three days off after these games, back-to-back games, a regulation loss in Calgary, which we'll get to. And then a thrilling comeback win in overtime last night against the Seattle Kraken. So we'll hit that with hammer and obviously his thoughts on the upcoming gray cup, as well as a little bit more on his great piece, that deep dive on blue bomber quarterback, Zach Caleros. And It's also World Cup week, folks. I cannot believe this, but I am going to be in Qatar a week from today getting ready for Canada's return to the World Cup for the first time since 1986. Really looking forward to um, getting out there for that. And we found out who's representing Canada yesterday. I don't think we could have a better guest to come on today's show than our good friend Rob Gale, former Valor FC head coach, who, of course, coached more than half of our national team named yesterday as members of the junior program with Canada while Rob was coaching there. So Rob Gale, a little bit later on, on Canada at the World Cup. Really looking forward to that. Um, Just before we do get going, do want to give a big thanks to all of the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Special shout out to the gang at Not Auto Corp. Took in the game with Trevor and a bunch of his staff yesterday at the incredible atmosphere of IG Field. Um, Was great to meet many of them. And, of course, uh, big thanks to Trev for including me in such a great, great day. Uh, cool Bet Canada, Princess Auto, Boston Pizza, Canadian Club, Culligan Water, Royal Sports, F Apparel, the gang over at Consolidated Supply, Vita Health Fresh Market, and, of course, our friends at Wallace and & Wallace. Um, just before I bring Michael Remus in, folks, do not forget we do have the survey going from Little Brown Jug. We had some great, great response last week. It's a big help to us if you can get on this. And the best part about it is they're going to be giving away a Grey Cup party package to the winner of a draw of everyone that uh, that gets in on it. Uh, Basically, the entire survey is going to take you about 30 seconds or so to do, if that. And uh, obviously, we really appreciate the support from Little Brown Jug and really appreciate your support. So if you do have a chance, Remus is going to put it in the description. There's also a post on our Twitter page from Friday. If you want to go click the link there, we'll throw something up on Instagram a little bit later on today. And in just a second, I'll also throw it in the live chat for anybody that wants to uh, that wants to click it. All right, let's get uh, let's get Remo in here and welcome him back to the program. Look who's back, the new dad, Michael Remus. What's up, Reem? Yeah, new dad, uh, I guess, times two. Yes. Ad- additional, additional dad. I've done it, done it before, but a bit tougher when you got two. 
But what a time to be back, Hustler. What a weekend. We had the West Final yesterday. Uh, what an atmosphere. IG Field and the Jets doubleheader. Oh, yeah, the Moose one as well. Um, I'm having a lot of memories of last year this time. Well, not exactly this time because the Grey Cup was in, was in December, but the Jets were playing well. I remember the Bombers were winning, uh, winning the Grey Cup. So a lot going on. Oh, yeah, World Cup too next week. So great part of the sports calendar. We did have some great football games as well. So uh, exciting stuff here this week on the program. And, oh, yeah, leading into this week, Hus, we have the Solani Newmanen night on Thursday and Big Hockey Day in Canada game. Uh, the Jets getting getting a home 6 o'clock game on a Saturday. Uh, lots lots to get to here. Lots to get to. Surprise that game was at 9 o'clock. By the way, gang, I just threw the uh, survey link in there for a little brown jug. So just click that. Um, take you 20 seconds or whatever to pull through. Say some nice things about WST. And uh, they are giving away $125 in beer and a $100 gift card at Smitty's to uh, grab a big ton of wings for your Grey Cup party wherever you're doing it and they'll be delivering it anywhere in Manitoba so if you are outside of the Winnipeg area don't worry about that Little Brown Jug has you covered um, well let's start with yesterday Remo I know you weren't at the game still dealing with the growing family I can tell you the bar was raised pretty damn high for sporting events environments last year against the Riders and I gotta tell you this was right up there with it um you know, we'll talk about the game and everything that happened around it. But first things first, I think we got to give a shout out to everyone that was at that stadium yesterday. It was absolute bedlam yesterday. Um, the crowd was such a massive factor in the game. Um, BC taking a couple penalties on the line of scrimmage, which I think makes it now 129, as they told us last night in the game, that of uh, penalties that the crowd had created. And even late in the game, it was so loud that BC ended up having to huddle, uh, you know, in that final minute of the game because they couldn't hear each other. And it cost them some valuable time and ended up having to just go with one of those uh, hook and ladder lateral plays that um, obviously ended up going forward. So uh, I, I, you watched the game on the tube. I mean, did it did it sound, did it seem as crazy as it was in the building? Because honestly, that was uh, another all-time environment at IG Field. The Bomber fans certainly brought it. Yeah, you could tell uh, the crowd was having an impact. They mentioned on the broadcast. Uh, the pig is very picturesque with the snow falling. I was at last year's game and having flashbacks. A bit warmer than last year's West Final, but uh, you saw there at the end where, uh, you know, it's a time where you got to hurry up and get going. The crowd is so loud. They couldn't, you said, couldn't huddle. Uh, how They let the clock run down quite a bit in the final two minutes when you want to be going rapid plays. I, I was pretty nervous. Um you know, Nathan Rourke, chance to tie it. You know, you touch on the and the two points, but the crowd, they couldn't they couldn't even get plays off. So it was um a pretty wild atmosphere there. It was great to, great seeing it on TV, made for a great game. Both games, um, great. The first game, uh high very high scoring as well. So bombers, bombers Argos. Bombers Argos. Andrew Harris back on the field for the Argonauts and back in the Grey Cup going against the team that let him go. I mean, as I said right off the bat, I mean, the stories literally write themselves. Um, and we'll have plenty of time to talk about Harris getting a crack at the Bombers and what the Argos have done this year as we preview the Grey Cup later on this week. Um, as far as last night's game, though, goes, I'll say this. The Bomber defense, which has been the backbone of this club, the defense, the offensive line, I mean, man, did those guys step up and deliver monster, monster performances. Willie J was everywhere. That huge strip earlier in the game when the Bombers had inexplicably, through a couple of mistakes, allowed BC back into the game. Like, real BC had a 7-6 six, six lead and had two yards of offense. Um, it was a pretty bizarre way, and in some ways it sort of reminded me of last year where the Bombers, you know, made a bunch of mistakes in the first half turning the football over five times, but the line, the Blue Bomber defense held them in. Um, this was a masterpiece defensive performance. And to be honest, if it wasn't for some other mistakes on special teams, as we mentioned with the, you know, the fumbled punt, which allowed BC to get the ball on the doorstep of the Blue Bomber end zone, as well as, you know, some kicking issues, a couple missed extra points, including one that got returned all the way for two the other way. This game really shouldn't have been that close the way that it was. 
That being said, I don't think there was anyone in that building that didn't have 100% confidence that the Blue Bomber defense was ready to shut the door at the end of the fourth quarter, and that's exactly what they did. Yeah, as a textbook, Bombers, when you got the big lead in the second half, uh, you ran the ball like crazy, and there were a lot of questions early on in the season with Brady Oliveira. I think he's the last second half of the season quieted all those 20 carries, 130 yards yesterday. Dakota Prukop, um, you know, pretty good running the ball as well, seven carries for 37. He had the go-ahead. Touchdown. He also uh, completed the only pass he threw. Nice to have that kind of deception. Uh, game started off great, Huss. Uh, Bombers getting on the board early. Dalton shown doing what he's done all year, and that is score uh, touchdowns. And it looked like you know the Bombers are going to have another, a chance at another touchdown early on after that blocked punt. And I think a lot of people looking up the rules for the CFL for punt blocks. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how you're supposed to block a pun without running into the kicker. Is it is it physically possible to do that? But uh, they had the, you know, what, the roughing the kicker because you hit the plant leg, which you cannot do uh, at any time uh, as of 2019. That was, and then eventually you had the, what, the Janarian Grant uh, muffed, but you had the muffed punt and they scored a touchdown after that very wild uh, first quarter. Has. Well, for sure. Uh, and listen, I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, I was one of those people wondering what the hell that call was. Um, and it was a massive, massive call. I mean, that turns around from the Bombers having the 6 nothing lead with the ball on about the 15 or 20-yard line of BC um, to them having the opportunity to continue to go, move the 15 yards up, punt at 60, fumble it, and then BC's got a first down in the second on the two. I'll say this about Janarian Grant, though. Man, did he make up for it. I mean, certainly the play of the game was his return for a touchdown later on that um, in a lot of ways sort of made up for that miscue and put the points that they gave up on the initial mistake back on the board for the Bombers. He was uh, he was a huge part of the game, and honestly, special teams, we knew with a talented team like BC, even though their offense was really held in check for most of the afternoon, special teams plays in these playoff games, especially in the Canadian Football League, a three-down league, has it often gets overlooked, but it is championship teams have good special teams, and you know Mike O'Shea coming at, in as a special teams coach has you know just done a masterful job of setting his team up for success. Although I'm sure he wouldn't have liked a few of the mistakes that happened yesterday with the muff, and then certainly the coverage on that return that went all the way back for two points the other way. Um, but these are correctable things. These are things that the Blue Bombers are going to be able to work on. The bottom line is, Mirmo, that you know, pretty much to a man, they stepped up, got it done. Although I will be honest, there was a lot of very nervous fans in the building when we saw Drew Brown go in late in the game after Zach Caleros was tackled awkwardly by BC. Yeah, I mean, the image of the game was Zach at the end trying to run on the field and took a couple steps. He clearly wasn't right and stepped off. And, and like we had that feeling back in week one, when he had to leave in concussion protocol, and Drew Brown came in and led them on a what a go ahead drive. So I wasn't too worried about you know the game, but you're more worried about okay, how are they going to go next week? And Zach said after the game that he's fine, and I don't know, you know, it looked, it looked pretty bad at the time, but he says he's fine, he'll be good to go, and nothing to be concerned about. But that was that was the image of the end of the game. Uh, Zach Clare was trying to run on the field and uh, seemingly not able to. Yeah, I heard Mike O'Shea talking about it afterwards on the ride home from the game on the OB post game show, saying that, you know, he wasn't able to be out there at the time. Obviously, it was a concern, but they do expect him to be well. I think what will what will really tell the story is what we see at Zach Caleros in practice this week. Now, at this point, I mean, did they need to have Zach out, you know, fully practicing all week? Probably not. But at the same time, I think he definitely will want to be out there. And I think we'll get a pretty good idea about how much this may be a factor in the game, depending on if he's out there with his teammates practicing throughout Grey Cup week, getting ready for the Argos on Sunday afternoon. Um, overall, though, uh, just a magical day. Shout out to every fan that showed up there rocking the blue and being loud all afternoon, 30,000 plus. Uh, a huge, huge part of of the win yesterday. And I would imagine Remo, there'll be plenty of individuals. I certainly know of tons that are with us today on the show with us in chat 
and were at the game last night that are going to be heading out to Regina to represent the back-to-back champs to see if we can get the three-peat and then officially call the Bombers a modern-day dynasty. Uh, I, why can't we call them a dynasty? Yeah, but they have to win. I think they're pretty much... Yeah. Back to back, they're pretty back much. To back they happens back. all the time. They went to the Grey Cup for the third time. Come on, they're they're up there, and uh, I think a lot of people are going six hour drive. I see a lot of people on Facebook trying oh. to sell their tickets. A lot of Rough Riders fans, I think, jumped the gun and they thought they had a better team. I will say this: uh, the end of the game, uh, Farhan Lalji does the uh, trophy presentation, and you know I'm usually on team. Look, celebrate the wins. You got to touch the trophy, but saw so the guys in front. They have one goal in mind, back-to-back Grey Cups, and I fully support it. These guys have, you know, after you win back-to-back Grey Cups, the Western final trophy, that's like nothing. I, they've done it, been there, done that. You want to get the, the big title. So, look, for Colorado Avalanche, they lifted the Campbell Bowl. Look, they had a lot of play. Look, they had a tough time, you know, getting that far. It took them a long time to do it. You got to celebrate it. The Bombers, they, they've done this. They've won the you know, Western final a couple times in a row already. So they want to win the big one. I did enjoy that. And I do expect to see a lot of bomber fans there. And we want people asking, what's the line? What's it going to be? Minus four and a half on cool bet right now. I was surprised. I thought that that might be more like six, but I think um, the fact that if you look at the the head to head matchups, excuse me, if you look at the head to head matchups between these teams room over the last couple of years, the Argos have played the bombers incredibly tight i mean we all remember the argos coming back in their head-to-head matchup earlier this year early in the season and they essentially were tied the game i mean they had the opportunity to go for two andrew harris wanted to go for two to go for the win they decided to send bd out to kick the extra point to tie it and send it to ot and he missed so i mean that was a razor thin margin of victory um and you know the argos gave the bombers all they could handle last year as well so I think this is going to just be an incredible, incredible matchup. Should be a really fun Grey Cup week. And it couldn't get any better, certainly for the guys writing about it. And we'll talk about with this hammer, with the hammer a little bit later on, that it's Andrew Harris coming back. We all thought that he was out for the season. Not, no, not at all. Rehabbed all year long. Came back in, got in the end zone yesterday. And he will be front and center with the double blue going up against the blue and gold in Regina next week. Yeah, a lot of big throws. Bombers going for three. Andrew Harris against his former team. Uh, you know, got the coaches, former bomber Ryan Dinwiddie on the other side there. And this Argos team, they're a good team, Huss. Uh, I think their defense has has been pretty, performed pretty well all year. They've given the Bombers uh, fits. They beat the Bombers uh, last year as well. Um, I, don't, I just had questions about McLeod Bethel Thompson. Um no, not really that accurate, although he was yesterday 70%, 19 to 27. I sometimes throw his interceptions. He didn't do that yesterday. He had two touchdowns and zero. And we kind of joke that you know, the Argos are you know, assembling a CFL all-star team from a couple years ago with Tavares Daniels, Brandon Banks, and, and Andrew Harris. But uh, Daniels had a pretty big game, 108 yards. And Harley Gittens, he's emerged uh, this year. And they got the two-headed monster running back. So they got a solid offense. Uh, defense has been, uh, they got, they got, Hey, they gave up 27 points, uh, points yesterday. So, uh, four and a half, it's going to going to be a close one. And I'm, I can't wait us. The countdown begins now. No doubt about it. I'm just looking, I just pulled up the, uh, the weather for Regina coming up next week. For those of you that are going to be heading out there, looks like it's going to be pretty chilly on Thursday, a high of only minus 11 and then warming through the weekend, high of minus seven on Friday, minus six on Saturday. And right now, for game day, expecting minus six for your daytime high and sunny. That probably means by the time the game kicks off, you're probably a few degrees below that. But uh, I guess the wind will be a huge factor as well. Um, one one bit in the chat. And uh, who is it that, that said, oh, Dom Zappia, besides Caleros, concerned about our kicking. When the other team outscores you on the point after, after missing two out of three, had that ever happened? That is weird. The Bombers on their converts got one point and BC got two on Bomber converts. Um, Listen, I don't think that's going to happen again. That certainly will be a point of emphasis. Uh, But the bottom line is Mark Leggio is going to need to have a a much better game than he did yesterday, I think, for the Bombers to win. 
Um, certainly if it's close, I mean, they'll be leaning on the kicker and that, you know, we saw it last year with Sergio Castillo, how impactful he was in the win over the Hamilton Tiger Cats in the Bombers last Grey Cup championship. Um, so a lot of pressure on Mark Leggio, but Remo, we can remember that his best moment this year, which I think erased a lot of the nervousness around the kicking position was his performance in the Labor Day Classic with that 52 yarder that he sailed through. So, um, he can lean on that, but um, he's going to be a very, very important player, and he's going to need to uh, clean it up a little bit after what we saw yesterday, especially on those extra points. Yeah, field goals, uh, he was great. Um, you know, the bom- Bombers I mean, had a bit of trouble at times getting into the end zone, but there he was, three for three, and you mentioned that, uh, le- I don't want to say legendary, but you know that field goal this year to beat uh, the Rough Riders. So he's definitely familiar with the stadium there. But those extra points, I mean, those sports are supposed to be free. They're supposed to be gimmies. And it is kind of funny, a team having a negative point differential after scoring three touchdowns on extra points. <laughs> Has that ever happened? That's that's good. I, I like that. That's some good trivia right there. But you don't want to be on that, that end. end no, that. definitely not. T. Konopoly, in legs we trust. No worries. I like your, I like your positivity, to T. Konopoly. Uh, and then uh, oh, there's a lot of interesting chat right now. Um, by the way, some other big CFL news just before we move over to the Winnipeg Jets, and we will talk about the game and the Bombers with both Westy and Jeff Hamilton coming up in a few minutes. We have a trade to announce. Uh, Remo, Bo Levi's rights traded to the Hamilton Tiger Cats. So it looks like the Tiger Cats trying to get a bit of a head start on the former MOP and Grey Cup champ moving over to the East potentially. Yeah, no surprise. Calgary uh, is moving on from Bo Levi. They declared Jeffrey Mayer the starter. Or, sorry, Jake Mayer. Jeffrey Mayer is the guy from the uh, yeah from the Yankees. Baltimore Orioles. Uh, yeah, t- Tony <laughs> Tarasco. So I do that a lot, actually. I do that a lot. Jake Mayer, they've moved on uh, with him. I thought he was pretty good, although they did put Bo Levi in in that semifinal there when just couldn't get anything going uh, with that loud crowd in, in BC. But... I'm kind of surprised that it's Hamilton. We thought it was going to be Saskatchewan. There you're moving on from Fajardo. Uh, Dane Evans, he came on. He was pretty good, I think, in the second half of, of the season. We saw him torch the Bombers, if you remember that game earlier this year. So I'm surprised uh, they're going, they are going. They're trying to go after Bo. Uh, Dave Neal reporting they acquired his right. So we'll see We'll see what, what it leads to. I thought, I thought there was one destination, and it was pretty clearly a Saskatchewan for him, but apparently not. And... You know, Hamilton, they had Masoli and Evans, you know, go to back to back Grey Cups. And what now they're done with both of them, just like that, apparently, or they could be done with both of them. Yeah, uh, that'll, I'm sure that'll be a big topic over Grey Cup week. But <clears throat> of course, it's all going to be about the Bombers and Argos when they kick off on Sunday at Mosaic Field. We're going to get to that with Troy Westwood in just a couple minutes. Um, hey, folks, we got a real exciting announcement. We've been working on this for a while, and today we are proud to announce, announce and launch our Unsung Heroes program with our friends Wallace and Wallace and Josh Morrissey of the Winnipeg Jets. You know all about Unsung Heroes on the ice and on the field, but what about the ones in our communities? You know who we're talking about, the guys who's always first out the door after a storm, clearing his neighbor's driveway, or the mom who coaches her daughter's soccer team and takes charge of the school fundraisers. With the help of Winnipeg Sports Talk listeners, Wallace and Wallace and we want to celebrate the many acts of kindness in our unsung community heroes do every day. How is that? Well, we're inviting WST listeners to nominate an unsung hero in their community by shooting us an email at unsunghero at winnipegsportstalk.com. If you know someone who goes above and beyond, take a minute to say thank you and send us their name and what they're doing to build a better community. We'll sing their praises by sharing some of their stories throughout the month. And at the end of the month, we'll randomly select one lucky unsung hero to win an autographed Josh Morrissey Jets jersey. And every month, Wallace and Wallace will make a $500 donation, which will be matched by Josh and Margot Morrissey to the Dream Factory in the name of the Winnipeg Sports Talk listener who submitted the nomination. One act of kindness plus a nomination from a Winnipeg Sports Talk listener equals $1,000 a month to make a dream come true for a child battling a life-threatening illness. Just send your nomination again to Unsung Hero at WinnipegSportsTalk.com. We'll find more about the Dream Factory in coming days and weeks. 
And we'll hopefully have Josh on the program as well to talk about his work with it. And of course, the great start he's had to the season. Um, our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market, busy, busy now as we look ahead to the holiday season. If you were looking for great prices on natural and organic supplements, beauty products, and groceries, and Winnipeg's largest assortment of local products, shop at one of the seven Vita Health Fresh Market stores or online at myvita.ca. <clears throat> oh, hey, November is considered Men's Health Month, and choosing the right natural products are key. Vita Health carries everything you need to help relieve prostate issues, reduce stress, and support mental focus from Canadian brands like Prairie Nationals who donate a portion of their sales to the Canadian Men's Health Foundation. Vita Health Fresh Market, empowering people to lead healthy lives. Seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge, and online at myvita.ca. And hey, a big thanks to the gang at Consolidated Supply. Working on potentially something involving that Marble series that we're discussing. We'll let you know about that in the next little bit. But Consolidated, it, listen, people are already looking ahead to next year whether it's for the golf season, whether it's for their landscape, whether it's making sure the projects that they maybe were thinking about this year come to reality next year, balls or a consolidated supply is the spot to go. Your first choice for irrigation, golf, fertilizer, supplies, artificial turf as well, and of course, golf cars as the club car dealer. Also got amazing options for that dream backyard, including outdoor kitchens, hot tubs, and more. And they are the leader in small engine parts and small engine part repair. Pop down and see them, 1395 Niagara Road East, or hit them up online at cte.ca at Consolidated Supplies. New relaunched website. Looking very much forward to putting this together coming up next month. All right, let's get to it. Bombers going back to the Grey Cup and very interested in our Next, gets thoughts on the Winnipeg Jets start to the season. It is the man, you know, Mr. 661 himself, Troy Westwood, joining us now on WST. Westy, what's going on? How are you? Hanging and banging, brother. How are you doing? Oh, you know what? I warmed up after the game yesterday. It was uh, I mean, it, it, listen, it was not as cold as it was the year before for the West Final that was in December. But it was still Winnipeg outside the middle of November for four or five hours. But, uh, man, was it worth it. I mean, just an absolute scene there. I mean, the best team in the Canadian Football League and the best fan base this league has seen in a long time coming together, and both were very impactful in the game. What do you think about the way the Bombers got the job done and now move on to Regina with one more win before they can call themselves three-time defending champs? Just crazy, isn't it, Ben? I just the back to back to back thing, man, it's just absolutely nuts. So a little bit of a scare late in the game for uh, the gap, you know, the, the possibility. So any sort of uh, any um, anything that had just celebrating, you had to hang on a little bit, right, to send out the tweet or to tip back one in celebration just a little bit too late in the game there. But just spectacular. My goodness, like the defense, it's it just the whole, the entirety up and down the roster, essentially, is such a joy to watch us in the big games. And. Mike O'Shea is always so calm and in complete control. It's just absolutely magical. I, I, last week, I, I have to giggle and share this, Huss. I reached out to my dear buddy, Brad Foddy, equipment manager with the team since, I think, 1990. And you know, I was just I'm geeked like everybody else in the province and city getting ready for the Western Final. I say, hey, hey man, one more win away from the chance to go back to back to back. That's crazy. And he texts me back, hey, everybody's 0-0. We've got one game to win. <laughs> we're, we're focused on one game at a time. And I'm like, would you get, like, the culture of O'Shea? All right, all down to the equipment manager. It's just right through that dressing room, man. Everybody's dead, just focused and all serious. Well, the, you know, they were. And, and, you know, there were some similarities to last year's West Final in which the Bombers came out um, and made some uncharacteristic mistakes early on that really allowed Saskatchewan in the game. I mean, listen, there wasn't the five turnovers that happened last year, but a couple really crucial mistakes early on that basically just allowed BC back in the game. Listen, the block punt, I mean, that's really unfortunate. I mean, just a hell of a play. And O'Shea afterwards, being the special teams coach, said, hey, those are the rules. Can't do it. It was the right call. But then muffing that punt from uh, Janarian Grant and all of a sudden giving a team that was 0 for 4 passing, had no offense, a first down 
to just walk in right on the doorstep, I think, was was the break that BC needed. Really, from that moment on, the Bomber defense absolutely flexed their muscles and, and in my opinion, really dominated and took over that game as the Bomber offense continued to roll. Which, again, like you said, Hus, very uh, mirrored a lot last year. The bottom line success, you know, what, what helped to bring the team over that finish line to capture that second cup. Really, that defense was really the the backbone of everything, right? So, you, And you kind of wonder, going into this, into the Grey Cup game here, how much of a role it's going to be. What do you think uh, the Argos, think the Bombers favored by like 10-ish? What do you think that's going to be? S- sorry, the, the line? Yeah, what do you figure the line to be? Is it already out? I thought it was going to be around six. Yeah. And it's actually it, four, huh? and it's actually four and a half. Only four and a half? Well, and you know what? I think part of wow. that is, you know, looking at the head-to-head matchups between these teams huh. the last couple of years. I mean, we remember Beatty missing wow. that kick that would have put it to overtime earlier this year. And Andrew Harris was quite clear that he wanted the rock and he wanted to go for two to win that football game. Um I believe the Argos got the Bombers last year as well. So they haven't played each other very much. Um, But I think there is some respect for what the Argos have done. And the one thing the Bombers do is they win all these close games. They don't necessarily blow the doors off their opponents. And um, listen, that sets them up well for championship football because you know it's going to be a full 60-minute matchup. But I, like you, was a little surprised that the number was where it was. But I guess if people want to jump on the Bombers, that might be a good thing. Cannot not, not mention Andrew Harris's return yes. <laughs> to the lineup and oh to the Grey Cup with the double blue going up against the team. I mean, we've always talked about the incredible boulder on the guy's shoulder. Um, yeah. As I said, these <laughs> dude, these stories just write themselves. But um, what a, what a feat just to come back with the injury that he had. And uh, Man, this is a guy that just seems unstoppable in so many ways, and it just sets up some of the juiciest storylines for the game next Sunday. Oh, yeah, man. Their first 15 plays might just be handing it off to 33, <laughs> right? Like, the way, like, like, and I love what you say, the boulder on his on his shoulder instead of a chip, man, for sure. And he's going to be a handful, isn't he? Like, holy smackers, man. That D-line, like, everybody, it's just going to be something to watch. He's And with a guy that plays with a boulder on his shoulder all the time, let's take that. I don't know what kind of exponential growth you can manufacture in a championship game against the team that, you know, kind of unceremoniously just, uh, you know, move along sort of thing. We're going with the younger fellas, but that's going to be, that's the whole game right there, right? How much damage is he going to cause? How much can he control? And, and we saw him so many times lift the bombers to just remarkable heights, almost like carrying the entire team from a spiritual standpoint. What's his impact going to be in that game? Well, and, and and of course, I mean, the other guy that, like I said, I don't think it changes the job at hand, but it does add another layer for the bomber running game and Brady Oliveira. Yeah. Um, and Oliveira was an absolute stud yesterday. We knew in the cold, and I, I don't imagine it'll be much different next year, next week. I mean, they're going to want to win the line of scrimmage on both sides of it. And they're going to want to be able to run the football, which they did all afternoon long with Brady leading the way. But it is fascinating that this is where we're finishing up this season because we all remember the first four or five weeks of the year where Brady and the Bomber running game was struggling. Andrew Harris looked like Andrew Harris. And there was a lot of thoughts, including here, is like, well, if this keeps going and the Argos out of it, maybe the Bombers could get Andrew back at the trade deadline. Well, they're going to be seeing him again, but not in blue and gold. And uh, I'm really interested to see how the Bomber running game you know, matches up to what the Argos are going to be bringing because they have set and they haven't missed a beat. I mean, he's had a thousand yard season, um, you know, went for what almost 140, 150 yesterday in the game. I mean, he, um, he has turned into the guy that they wanted him to be, but it's sort of like the, uh, the pupil going up against the master in this game. And uh, what a fascinating side story on both sides of the football. And Hus, can we maybe touch on, as I was watching that game yesterday and listening to the commentary and, and all that sort of stuff, I just started to remember and reflect on the level of struggle from the O-line specifically prior to the arrival of Kevin Walters being, or Kyle Walters being the GM, and how quickly that that unit that typically takes years, right, from drafts and that sort of thing to, to rebuild, how quickly the Bombers turned that around under Walters and the level that it's maintained since that time. That... I. 
when you look at the greatness of the Bombers over the last, if we want to say, handful of years with a couple of cups and very strong prior to that, whatever the time frame you want to use, that the old line has got to be a, a huge part of defining the possibility of of winning those two cups and 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 just uh, being such a high level team. It was such a masterful, remarkable job that Kyle Walters pulled off in constructing that. Stanley Bryant. I've often said that I think Andrew Harris might be the most impactful free agent signing ever in the CFL. I mean, his presence, what he did on the field, off the field, creating that winning culture. But I'll be honest, the acquisition yeah. of Stanley Bryant is right there as well. Yeah. And it's so easy to overlook, you know, the big guys up front. They're almost like refs sometimes. If you don't notice them, they're probably doing a good job. It was hard not to notice what Bryant and the rest of those crew was doing in front of Brady Oliveira last night. And, I mean, that really was. You bring back to Walters. He had two things. We need to improve the offensive line so our quarterbacks don't keep getting killed. Just ask Buck Pierce. And they needed to improve the Canadian talent. They did both of that, and that has been the cornerstone, the foundation of this back-to-back -back championship team that has had a chance to go for three next week. Yeah, and uh, an entire generation of Bomber fans that say drought there was a drought what <laughs> what happened all those losers that for, played for that many years and never won like, it's just amazing man that and you know when we were kids Huss, right edmonton had that five in a row and then there were teams like uh calgary that won often and the owls that were a powerhouse for those years under cavillo but it hasn't really been since edmonton that there's been uh, something of this nature and you know people can debate and argue well is too um worthy of talk of dynasty and i would say maybe no to that but there's no question whatsoever you reel off three in a row and now everybody associated to this team the whole the whole group of the three canadian mafia and you have played a, a major role in creating the most recent dynasty in the cfl troy westwood is with us westy you are uh you're our go-to guy. You are our Winnipeg Sports Talk kicking expert and analyst. Um, what did you make of Mark Leggio yesterday? Uh, and the special teams overall. Listen, Janarian Grant certainly made up for that gaffe earlier with that heart-stopping run to the house. But as someone brought up in chat, I don't know if there's ever been a time where a team scored three touchdowns and actually lost points on, on, the, on the converts. They made one. <laughs> Missed two, including one that went back the other way. Um, where's the confidence level right now in Legu, who had had a few downs, but obviously maybe had his highest moment all season long in the Labor Day Classic in the stadium that they'll be playing on Sunday? Yeah, and that's the one thing, right, that Bomber fans can hold close to the heart, that we have seen this kid bounce back strong before. So I would lean towards him bouncing back pretty strong here. I I knew that rule was in place for their returning an, uh, an extra point, and, and, you know, whether it's a bad snap, missed, uh, whatever it might be, for and grab a couple points. But I don't know, have we ever seen one actually unfold in the CFL? I can't recall. I can't recall it. But it's such a – and I was talking to my son about it yesterday, who you know, kicks in high school and still has the very short extra point. It's just um, when you have that much space on either side of the uprights from 32 yards. And the thing is, the whole world still expects you to make that, right? The whole world still expects it just to be seven points. You score a touchdown. So I, and I, I try and imagine, I, I don't know. I've thought many times, what does it feel like as a kicker going out there for a 32 yarder that everyone expects you like, it's a hundred percent. You have to make this sort of thing. You know, it, there's always pressure with every kick and that sort of thing, but the absoluteness of the guaranteed extra point, it's gotta be a little bit tricky and a, a, a little bit of a, a mind thing when you're going out there for sure. So hopefully he settles down and, and throws him through. But I think that he'll respond strongly, man. You know, uh, overall, Westy, just before I get your thoughts on where the Jets are at right now, this was a game that the big boys stepped up and made big plays. And I mean, Willie Jefferson, you know, we've talked a lot about the guys on the offensive line and Hardrick and Patty Newfeld. I mean, they were they were stars yesterday. But when things were a little hairy there and it seemed like, wow, we just opened the door for BC to come back in, Willie was a terror all day long, including shutting down Butler in the running game. I'm not sure if they thought that they could just run it, Willie. That was one of the things, but it did not work. And then the strip that he made, one of the most important plays in the game. We know how much turnovers can flip a game. And the Bombers had given one away and they got one back thanks to five. 
He is such a stud, huh? And he's, <laughs> he's so likable, too, on top of it all. And all-time just, beauty. Oh, he's something, man. And you talk about, like, uh, Stanley Bryant and acquiring different players and that sort of thing. Certainly, he's right up there. With such a key cog on, the, on that side of the ball, man. But you just – how can you not absolutely love and adore him as, as a player and, and just his presence away from the field as well? Just an awesome dude. So uh, just uh, what what's your level of confidence for the Bombers to get this thing done? I mean, you know, the Argos are a good team. They played very close games the last couple of years. Uh, it seems like they've been on a mission all year long, and uh, they got 60 more minutes to prove that they are not just a championship team, but one of the most special groups of men we've seen in this league um, in decades. It was a few weeks ago that I was, there was a stat, I can't recall it off the top of my head, Huss, but you mentioned it earlier in us speaking here, where the Bombers, the number of games that they've had that were one-score games, and their record in those one-score games is ridiculous. It's just nutso. But I, and I know that, uh, you know, Toronto plays them tough, and I think Andrew Harris is going to be good, but I think they're going to bust out a little bit here, man. I'm going to say the Bombers win by 15, and we're celebrating with, I don't know, maybe two, three minutes left in the game. We've got possession. They're holding the ball, watching that time tick down. And we're just, and people are throwing back the wobbly pops and throwing popcorn up in the air, celebrating a comfortable win. I want you to think those guys are going to enjoy taking over the Riders locker room for Grey Cup week. <laughs> yes. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's that's beautiful, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Westy, well, I mean, obviously the Bombers are the main story today, but um, the Jets have been giving us some great headlines and some great conversations so far. What have you thought about the uh, the start to the season under Rick Bonus, who, of course, missed what eight of the first 10 games as he was dealing with COVID. My favorite thing that I've heard or read from Rick Bonus, uh, I believe it was last week when he said, hey, look, when we have the puck, our lines look different, right? The different skill sets come to the fore and, and we're going to look different when we have the puck. What's really important, what's most important is when we don't have the puck, that all of our lines look the same. That was such a profound statement to me. And you can apply it to almost any sport when you have possession of the treasured puck in this case or not. And, and you know, is everyone, is everyone as deeply involved and invested when you lose possession and bing, it goes to defense. And I just, I love so far what he's bringing to the table. It, it feels, and by everyone I speak to, like you, you're kind of wondering, is it fool's gold? Is it too good to be true? But, they got something going on there, man. And something hmm. seems to have shifted in that locker room. Whatever the troubles were there the last couple few years seems to have worked its way out of the room or something or being set aside. I'm not sure, but it's been a great ride early on, Huss, and let's enjoy it. Well, and, and you know what? Speaking of that, we've got to give a tip of the cap to the former captain, longtime Winnipeg Jet Blake Wheeler, scored that massive goal last night for number 300 on his career. And... You know, while we haven't been talking about Wheeler, you know, night in and night out, um, you know, as far as, you know, what he's doing on the ice, um, you know, he certainly has been a guy that, you know, Rick Bonus and Scott O'Neill have been able to count on, working quite well with Cole Perfetti and with Pierre-Luc Dubois. But most importantly, I mean, regardless of the game results from one night to the other, because obviously they will vary, the way that he's handled, um, the the deal that he was given right off the bat, I think has been huge for this team. And um, it was pretty cool to see Mason Appleton give wheels the jacket last night after tying it up late. Um, and the way that he's handled the new role. I mean, I'm not sure that there could be a better example of real leadership than, you know, basically taking what happened to him with some humility and still being part of the team moving forward. And um, I think it's been a great sign, and I think it's reflecting in a lot of other areas of the new vibe around this team that we heard from Mason Appleton last week when he joined us on the show. Yeah, you hear a lot of things uh, possibly about Wheeler related to leadership things, and I've never been around it firsthand or, or have witnessed it, but the one thing for sure, man, that all Jets fans are aware is when he steps on, on, the, on the ice, man, that he's full go, right? He's just always has been for years now. And, you know, you can debate and argue the uh, contract, all the rest of it. But whenever he's out there, man, he's giving you every single thing he's got, no doubt. Well, and then, uh, but you know, his maybe removal from that core or being the guy, I think, has allowed so many other players to step up and, you know, take a bigger piece of that leadership role. And Rick Bonus has said a number of times, I mean, on good teams, 
the players are leading the way. And um, I love your thoughts. I mean, we had plenty of conversations last year about what was up with Mark Shifley. I think he has backed up all the talk coming into this year with what he's been doing on the ice. And then, you know, a player like Josh Morrissey, who I think has just elevated his game. And we also have to mention Connor Hellebuck, who's reminding everyone that um, he is still at the highest level of elite goaltenders and, frankly, players on this Winnipeg Jets. And, man, winning begets winning and good vibes. Um, you know, there's a lot of fun things happening, and there's a lot of players that I think have a big piece of this right now. It is really cool, and it's so absolute. Just the rule in hockey where if the guy between the pipes is strong or somewhere between strong and super strong, any tiny little warts or anything like that, how much that can cover up and just you know go grab a win in a situation where maybe it, it shouldn't have ended up like that. But yeah, what Hello, Hello Buck's doing is just fantastic. I love seeing the growth uh, and sort of the reemergence there of Josh Morrissey a little bit. And for sure, Shifley, uh, like I, I made it clear, I would have traded him two minutes after the cup was raised last year because of the, like I, I thought a level to that degree needed to happen here to, to shift things. But thus far, bonus, whatever the impact is here that he's made, it's just come coming to fruition, and and the boys are reeling on a bunch of points. Yeah, and uh, back, you know, after those back to backs, what twenty two hours between the two games? I mean, a difficult schedule, despite having the rest on either sides of it. And then, of course, Westy. I mean, Thursday night, the Hall of Fame game, Timu Tepo. I know you've got some fond memories of those guys when they were wearing Jet jerseys and what they did during the one point oh era. Yeah, and really well done by the club. I've seen a couple examples of that, really, huh? Like a, that a thing with Salming a couple of days ago as well, just heartfelt stuff. The the league is doing a good job right across the board with a bunch of that stuff. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, Troy West is with us. Wow, we've got 500 in the group. Westy brings them out, folks. Hit that thumbs up button. Let's get those likes up to, uh, let's get it over to, hon. How about that? And if you haven't already, or maybe you're just finding us right now, hit that red subscribe button. We are here every day. We're live Monday to Friday, 1 o'clock p.m. with the latest on the world of sports, focusing on the Jets, Bombers, and everything going on around here in the city of Winnipeg and province of Manitoba. That being said, Westy, next week, we got the Grey Cup on Sunday. We've also got the World Cup beginning. Listen, I've never been more excited about a trip coming up. This is going to be a wild experience. But I know you have followed soccer for a long time. I mean, we talked off the air about the qualifying and the run that the Canadian men's team has. And now it's happening. Canada is back. What did you think of the squad yesterday? And uh, how excited are you to see Canada return to the biggest event in the world? So geeked, man. I think it's so wicked and awesome that you're going, brother. I just can't wait to live that sort of vicariously through you, uh, for sure, to some degree, man. It, just uh, how much fun that's going to be and how, like, th that, that to me, us is a spiritual sort of thing. When you're going to the World Cup, that's that's uh, just tremendous. And with, of course, uh, with Canada there, and I've played since I was 15 years old locally, I've played on the Croatian squad, kind of adopted by the community. So being in the same pool, We'll be making our way to the Croatian church uh, to watch, take in some of the games and that sort of thing. And I, I'll co coach my son, who's a part of a U14 group, and the entire team is invested, ready for the World Cup. It's really neat this year because it's almost like it's a Christmas or a holiday season present of sorts, right? Because normally in, in June sort of thing, but just been so excited for it for so long, Huss, and the fact that it's, what, six days away, man? Oh my goodness. I was so, so excited for it. Yeah, it is going to be fun. And, you know, we've got the, you know, these stars and listen, Alfonso Davies is right there, but you know, the likes of Tejon Buchanan, um, you know, coming up and uh, Stacchio. I mean, uh, we're going to talk about it with Rob uh, Gale a little bit later on, who, ah. of course, coached more than half of the young men that were named to the national team yesterday. So uh, it's going to be a heck of a lot of fun. Westy, great chat. Thanks so much for doing this. Have a great week. Enjoy Grey Cup and uh, enjoy the World Cup as well. We'll have to maybe check in some point during the tournament. Would love your takes on that, as we always love having you on the program, but especially knowing how geeked you are about uh, the big event happening at Qatar. Always a bunch, a bunch of fun, brother, and have a fantastic time with the World Cup, man. <laughs> Certainly will. Thanks so much. There is our guy, Troy Westwood. Uh, if you're not already, give him a follow on Twitter, at Troy Westwood. 
And uh, just great to have Troy with us here on the program. Uh, all right. Uh, don't forget, if you're just popping in, folks, you can win a great prize pack for the Grey Cup, including $125 of our favorite local beer, Little Brown Jug, as well as a gift card for a bunch of wings, and they'll deliver it to you wherever you are in Manitoba. If you're with us right now on YouTube, I just popped it in there. Do us a favor, pop in there, quick 20-second, 30-second survey, and you will be entered to win that great prize from Little Brown Jug, and we'll let everyone know who wins it later on this week, Thursday, or I believe Friday, and they'll be delivering it in time for you to use it all for Grey Cup Sunday if you want to do that. All right, uh, Jeff Hamilton coming up in just a couple of minutes. Got to give a big thanks to our friends at Not Auto Corp. And uh, you know what? Listen, the why not question of the day was uh, was a tough one. We were going to talk about the highlight of the weekend. I mean, I think it basically had to be the Bombers win, although it was pretty fun for the Winnipeg Jets and the way they won it last night. Uh, but right now, your thoughts going in, your level of confidence on the Bombers to win a third straight Grey Cup in Regina. Hit us up in the chat right now or in the comments of the YouTube channel for our friends at Not Autocorp. As I mentioned, all the Not staff was out there yesterday at the game. Uh, but talking to them, they've been very, very busy right now. Lots going on. Listen, if you are looking for a new vehicle or looking to upgrade your one, uh, it all starts at Knot. Don't go anywhere before you pop down and talk to the experts at Knot Auto Corp. Why not get into the car of your dreams at a great price with the help of the Knot team? But if you've been sleeping on your winter tires, they've got winter tire specials right now and the MPI payment plan. So why not get safe tires now and pay later? Pop down and see the gang at Knot Auto Corp, Waverly and McGilvery, and all their products and services online as well over at not.ca. All right, well, Royal is busy right now. They've got a great World Cup selection that you're going to want to check out before the weekend. And I know they were absolutely insanely busy on the weekend with their big snowboard sale, as well as many people popping in to grab their scarves and toques for the game. Speaking of toques, folks, the WST New Era toque is now available. Uh, I've got about a dozen or so at Royal Sports if you want to pick one up. And if you're unable to get down to Royal, you can also check out the uh, website, winnipegsports.com. Click on store, get them, uh, get them before they are gone. Uh, of course, your Bomber Gear headquarters, Jets Gear headquarters, and so much more. NFL, Major League Baseball, World Soccer, Team Canada for the World Cup is all there. And Royal Sports is the reigning undisputed heavyweight champion of all things hockey, 40 years in the business with the experts working there. Pop down and see him and follow him on Instagram, by the way, at Royal Sports Pemina for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. And I know with the amount of people in here and the likes are going, we owe you guys a suit show. We'll be doing it. And I can't wait to do the suit shows now. I even made it up to the press box. Why? Because I went by and saw Andrew at F Apparel. I uh, went through the very simple and easy process of getting measured up, picking out the fabric I wanted, the color, the style. And a few weeks later, I had an amazing new suit at a great price. Custom suits beginning at just $400, all sorts of other menswear accessories and more. If you uh, need to upgrade the wardrobe, gentlemen, there's only one place to do it, F Apparel. And hey, if you got a wedding party or a wedding coming up next summer, Get the fellas together. If you order your suits before the end of November and get measured, everyone in the wedding party will get a free shirt and 10% off their order of savings of up to 130 bucks per person. F Apparel, 190 Smith Street downtown and online at F. That's E-P-H apparel.com. All right, let's welcome in the hammer. Hammer time on a Monday. Lots of bombers and Jets news and much more to get to. Jeff, what's going on? How was the uh, How was the weekend? Haas, I'm floating right now. I'm floating. It's uh, not just because the bombers, you know, were able to punch their ticket to the Grey Cup or the fact that the Winnipeg Jets came back from an improbable win. That's actually has well, not I'm going to say nothing to do with it. I'm just happy to be heading down to to Regina for my favorite week of the year, Grey Cup, and you know it doesn't matter. Well, I'm going to say it doesn't matter who the teams are. I think it does matter. And certainly, you know, this game is going to have a lot of juicy storylines. We can get into that. But uh, overall, great weekend, man. And uh, certainly looking forward to the upcoming week here. Yeah, there is going to be uh, Occupy Regina is uh, is in full effect by Blue Bomber fans. And I'm sure there'll be some folks coming out from the East to support the Argos. I mean, they may not have the numbers that the Bombers do, but they certainly do have a lot of passionate fans. It'll be excited to see it. 
Sure. But this is going to be a week and a game about the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And in some ways, you know, the, the one game opportunity to truly be called a modern day dynasty with three straight Grey Cup championships. Um, just before we get into yesterday's game and a look ahead, got to give you a stick tap. I mean, great, great piece on Zach Caleros on the weekend. Well, I mean, that was, I mean, any Bomber fan. Um, you know, should definitely read that. And I know you put a lot of work into it and went all the way down to Ohio. I'm sure that was a heck of a lot of fun. Um, but what's the plan for you? When are you heading out for Grey Cup week? And uh, give us a little bit of an idea about the schedule for the team and all of your coverage when uh, things get going. Yeah, Huss, thanks, uh, thanks for the, uh, you know, plug in that piece. I, you know, I teased it a little bit on, on you know, I think the last couple of weeks I've been on the show and, um, you're right. You know, it was a lot of fun to head down there and talk to Zach's, you know, closest family, friends, people who have really helped shape his life and and really have played a pivotal role in, in all the success we've seen from him in the CFL, you know, and so um, certainly appreciate that. And, you know, I, not that I wish there was like a camera on me because it's like these things, they're just they're so intense. You know, there's so much interviews to go through. There's so much whatever. So you just kill yourself for like three or four days um you know working throughout the day trying to you know craft something that you think is going to do justice so i certainly was happy with it got a got a ton of feedback you know you mentioned for people to have it for for bomber fans i think that some of the greatest compliments i've gotten emails have been from people who don't care about football that just you know enjoyed the story so anyway thanks again for that as far as this coming week me and my uh, colleague taylor allen will be uh will be all over it um you know the thing about the the, the cfl gray cup week is you know, of, of course, with the Bombers in it, we're going to have tons of coverage about the Bombers, storylines from players, you know, certainly storylines with the other team. I think there's a guy named Andrew Harris over on the other side that's going to probably be one of the, the juiciest, if not the juiciest storyline of the season as he seeks redemption after the Bombers, you know, ultimately cut him loose. Um, but yeah, just lots of work. It's not just the teams, though. I mean, it's as you know, as you know, as um, you know, I cover the league as a whole. I write a column every week about the league and, you know, news about it and, you know, I've lucky enough to have, you know, several sources around the league for news. And so it's always a fun week to talk about the CFL, right? You're, you know, you get all these reporters into one place, whether they're print or radio or TV and everybody, everybody's watching everybody, you know, what's the story is going to pop out? What's the, you know, what are the news we're going to, you know, bring up over the week? Well, you know, what are the scoops everyone's going to be chasing and, and yada, yada, because you have all the, you know, you have all the CFL personnel, which are, incredibly chatty all in one place for great cup all there for you to bother and and you know borderline harass for information so certainly you know i we're going to go through a team meeting uh later on today just to kind of talk about different ideas to do different stories to cover and um certainly looking forward to that but i can tell you there will be absolutely no shortage of uh you know of of, of uh, insight and articles and, and everything in between uh, for, as the Bombers chase, as you mentioned, history and, uh, you know, a potential three-peat here and to cement themselves as a dynasty. Well, we weren't going to be able to talk about that opportunity if they didn't get the job done yesterday. And it was a really interesting game. I mean, I think, you know, overall, much of what the Bombers have done most successfully was the hallmark of that win yesterday. Um, a brilliant defensive performance and an offensive line that exerted their will over the British Columbia Lions for the better part of 60 minutes. It wasn't perfect, though. Um, certainly, there was a few sloppy plays, a few opportunities where they really opened the door and maybe dragged the BC Lions back into the game. Overall, what were your thoughts about the Bombers' performance in their win in the West Final? I thought it was interesting. I thought Mike O'Shea said it perfectly when he called it maybe perhaps the oddest game he's he's ever <laughs> seen, really, right? I mean, it, it, it was super odd. I think it was Doc Claris, who I guess we'll get into his health and whatnot. I'm sure there's a lot of people that want to discuss what happened at the end of the game. Um, you know, I think he called it the longest game. That he, you know, it felt like the longest game he's ever played. Now, it, they didn't play any more than their, you know, their four 15-minute quarters, but it certainly did... Uh, did feel that way. And I mean, it, it, there was definitely, I think off the start when the Bombers who, if anyone's been paying attention this season, they don't often take the ball to start a game. You know, they usually, you know, decide what the wind is going to be. And and I'd say 99% of the time they're deferring and more often than not, the other team takes the ball so that they can make a decision in the second half, whether to take the ball or to take the, the wind, depending on, on, on what the conditions are for the final two quarters. Anyways, they march down the field, they score a touchdown. All of a sudden you're like, we're kind of looking around each other being like, is this going to be a, you know, quick work here? I mean, that was pretty impressive drive. Um, then of course you saw some of the hiccups on special teams, Janarian Grant, you know, 
Um, I think we were all, look, I don't know about you guys, but I think I was looking at like, why is he not getting under that ball? And is he not aware that this is going to be a, a bit of a slippery ride once the ball hits the turf? Anyways, we all saw what happened there led to a, led to a, uh, you know, a, a, not even a tying, a go ahead touchdown after Mark Leggio missed his point. Um, the extra convert. And so I felt like, you know, that kind of was a reality check that these games, you know, more often than not, <laughs> do not go to plan. They do not, you know, it's no easy victories, no easy wins in these. And I, I think you only have to look back at the last two seasons. I mean, that game against the Saskatchewan Rough Riders in the West Final last year, that was no gimme. Absolutely not. And I mean, in the year before that, um, against Saskatchewan in Regina was no gimme. I mean, we all know the, you know, the uprights hitting the uprights there. The, the riders were, were marching last season on a final drive to win. And, you know, the Bombers came up big. So, you know, and I think that, I think overall, I thought the game was just a fun game to watch. I think there were times where I think Bomber fans could breathe, but, you know, nearing the end there, uh, when it's an eight point game and, and then, you know, as much as Nathan Rourke was, was banged up most likely and certainly not a hundred percent, I think there was definitely a lot of people in there were wondering what if, and sure enough, the defense came up big as they as they have all season, and particularly that game to uh, to ice it for Winnipeg and punch their ticket to the cup. Well, I mean, listen, the defense was brilliant pretty much the entire game, um, and even with it being a one score game and the situation that it was late in the fourth quarter, I don't think there was much doubt that the Bombers were going to be able to close it out. But I will say this, Jeff. Uh, as crazy as the game was last year against the Riders and that crowd and, I mean, just a magical day in the latest game ever, of course, it was in December because of the, the delay in the schedule. I'm not sure the crowd's ever been more of a factor than they were yesterday. Um, even with the game on the line, with time running out, the British Columbia Lions had to go in and huddle. They were losing an extra 10, 15 seconds per play with a minute left in the game. And that was simply because they could not hear, they could not function with what the crowd brought. Um, the Bombers were ready for the elements, but holy smokes were the fans too. Do you share that? I mean, do you share that feeling that they were as impactful as we've seen before? Do I share that feeling, Hus? Absolutely. I mean, we've talked about it several times. I mean, I, I feel almost like a bit of deja vu saying it, but I, I've been saying that, you know, as, as loud as IG Field has been over this, you know, incredible run by the Bombers over the last few years, this year was a whole new level. I mean, I felt, you know, we talked about how I usually listen to the TSN games and, you know, I can certainly hear the audio on my computer. Well, this year I couldn't, you know, it was that crazy. And, and, you know, I, even the, you know, the storylines heading into this game, I mean, one of my five were, were the role that the, the fans were going to play. And they certainly did not disappoint. I mean, they were loud from start to finish. Uh, they certainly, um, you know, led to, I mean, we can get into the last minute there, but I mean, even throughout the game, I mean, there were times, points in, in the game where BC just looked, you know, in flux. I, yeah, and that was directly because of the, of the, of the noise made by the crowd. And, and don't think for a second that the defense isn't riding the high off, off, off all that, you know, energy off all that adrenaline that they're gaining from the fans. And then if you look at the last minute or so, I mean, I tweeted out, wow, nice, you know, nice clock management yikes by the BC lions. And I think I forgot for a, a moment there, just given the glasses in front of us and we don't get that full, full atmosphere. Again, you can still hear it. Um, but that was, you know, that certainly was put to rest after talking to the players and coaches. And it was absolutely bananas, the role that they did play. And I mean, and good on them, man. I mean, this is, you know, it wasn't necessarily, as you mentioned earlier in the show, about it wasn't, you know, m maybe as cold as it was last year when the game was played in December as the, as the season was moved, you know, moved back. But uh, it certainly wasn't, you know, balmy weather and, and people stuck in the whole time. And it was, you know, I thought it was interesting. There were times where, you know, even when you're in even Labor Day, you know, where the weather is obviously not an issue, uh, Riders fans would, would almost kind of yell when they got up, when the Bombers got up to center like they would they wouldn't start until they got to center so that whole play you know that whole seconds beforehand is when you call the play is when you get going once you get to the once you get behind center you already know what you're doing well I mean look at what Winnipeg fans did yesterday and it was right from the start they knew exactly what their assignment was and they showed up and they executed so do I share Absolutely, I share that sentiment, Huss. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, sometimes when you're a part of it, you want to be like, hey, are we making more of a big deal of it? But I, I don't think so. I don't know if you can overstate how important the crowd has been. Uh, you know, and in for a team that wins and has consistently won so many one-score games, often these do come down to one play, to one mistake, to one penalty. And um, 
Uh, it was all hands on deck for everyone wearing blue, whether they were on the field or in the stands yesterday. Um, who stood out to you, though, as far as the game overall? I mean, when you look back and you're writing the gamer, I mean, is there a player? For me, Willie Jefferson, I mean, he was a monster all game long, huge stopping the run as well. And, of course, that strip. And, uh, listen, I mean, we could talk about the Bomber offensive line all afternoon because, I mean, Brady Oliveira had a hell of a game himself but was the beneficiary of that line that has been the foundation for this Winnipeg Blue Bomber team over the last number of years. Yeah, I mean, you could look at Willie Jefferson, who is a you know a menace every game, even if he didn't have the you know necessarily the sacks that he that he usually racks up this year. This guy is someone the team's game plan you know through and through week in week out. I thought you could look at a guys like even Alden Darby. I thought stood up and you know played super well. Had some pass knockdowns. Had a key sack in the game. Could have probably had a, a couple interceptions. You look at Winston Rose. I mean, he hasn't exactly had a great season all year, but he came up big on a on a pick. You look at Desmond Lawrence. I mean, you probably want to knock that ball down, but he also had a, a, an interception and, and came up with some key. You know, I, you can go through the whole list. Adam Big Hill. I mean, if you want to use the same argument with Will, with Willie Jefferson and um, you know just having that that presence be an important part of it Adam Big Hill is exactly that way for opposing offenses I mean his his presence alone they know he's going to be on his P's and Q's and his, he's going to be in assignment sound so he certainly is a guy for that you know deserves recognition as uh, as well however the guy you got to start with is Brady Oliveira I mean this is a guy who you know as as much as the offense runs through Zach Claris and he certainly has been if you know Incredible all season is going to be the MOP again, absolutely this season once the awards are done on Thursday. Um, you know, but Brady Oliver was the guy who I think when you when you talked about X factors and who could play that role, who could be the guy that you know. And this is nothing to take away from him by calling him an X factor because the X factors are the guys you not necessarily expect to be kind of the difference makers in this case with the weather the way it was going to be with the reliance on the run game you know this is a young man 25 years old coming off his you know first thousand yard season as his first year as a starter I mean you look at the thousand and one yards he had and yeah he had some flashes some pretty good games to be sure but he still and I think I mentioned this on your show last week still you're still kind of were waiting for that elite performance where he put the team on his back much like Andrew Harris would do in that position before him, the guy that you know ultimately was passed the torch from, um, and you got that on Sunday. I mean, you got a guy who ran and looked like Andrew Harris. You got a guy who took contact and then then went through a couple more yards. I mean, this was the, this is the guy. Like it's almost you know if you're a Bomber fan, you got to feel damn good about this kid because not only is he you know coming into his own, but he's the kind of guy that cares about this city, cares about this team. He's everything that, you know, is representative about the Bombers and the culture they want there. And it's, and, and, and he's improved over the years. And so for him to have 20 carries for 130, 130 rushing yards, four receptions, I think he finished second on the team in receiving yards at 47 for him to put together 167 yard performance in, in the, the Bombers biggest game of the season. I mean, Again, I think it starts and ends with him as far as who you're gonna, you know, who you're gonna point out. I mean, there, of course, rather you don't get the yards that you get if you don't have the, you know, the character plays by guys like Rashid Bailey, who who was a game time decision. He's making big blocks. You have receivers being assignment sound, them making big blocks. You need the offensive line to, you know, create those holes and help the push. Those are all true, true things. But you need a guy who's carrying the rock to make a difference. And Brady Oliveira was all that and more in Sunday's win. Well, listen, we can't talk about Oliveira and the upcoming Grey Cup without talking about the guy that was carrying the rock for the double blue yesterday. And that, of course, is former bomber great Andrew Harris. I mean, you know, I know the, the big Jays like yourself say, hey, we don't cheer for a team. We just want the great stories. And you pretty much got one with Harris going up against this whole team for all the marbles on Sunday. I mean, you couldn't write it any better. Oh, you couldn't. I mean, this is a guy. And I mean, it's not just the fact that, you know, Andrew Harris is a, you know, a beloved member, former member of the Bombers here. I mean, his legacy speaks for itself. He, he really did mark, you know, help mark amongst other guys we've mentioned, you know, already in, in, in the Bombers ultimate turnaround. But it, it certainly started with him as he left years at BC to come to, to his hometown and, you know, to promise a to promise a great cup and ultimately deliver not just one but two, and then to have the off season that he had, you know, and and it you know it it wasn't it was a messy divorce. I mean, that's it, it wasn't you know 
no one was really quiet about it. Certainly Andrew wasn't quiet about his, you know, his displeasure and not being offered a contract and, you know, not really being kind of being left in the dark throughout the entire process, having to watch as guys like Brady Oliveira and Johnny Augustine each get contract extensions. You know, he's waiting here. I mean, this is a guy, again, for all those reasons, certainly probably deserved to be treated better or at least to be, you know, better in the know. Um, for all those reasons, I mean, this guy is absolutely motivated. I mean, how many times have you heard that Andrew has a chip on his shoulder? He's had a chip on his shoulder his entire career. You know, you, you look at his story and where he's come from. You know, he's looking to prove people wrong in every time he carries the ball. So for him to to go through what he went through over the winter and, and now have the opportunity, which I imagine he was envisioning uh, right from the beginning when he signed, with the Toronto Argonauts on the first day of free agency, knowing that, you know, Toronto would be a, you know, a, a force in the East and, and p- perhaps, you know, the, his best route to make it to the gray cup, um, you know, and then, and then to go through the season that he had with the, you know, eight games or whatever he played and then tearing his pectoral muscle and then having surgery. And then people saying that, you know, his season was over and then kind of hearing whispers with about six weeks before the end of the regular season that he was back to practicing and he got even closer. And then he plays in the, in the, in Sunday's East final. And then they, you know, scores a touchdown on his first carry of the game. I mean, yeah, I mean that's I I just wrote my story there off to listen back to the off to listen back to the to, to the show just to to write it down. But I mean that's you know of all the juicy storylines that are going to be there and readily available for this game, I don't think it gets much bigger. And I look forward to talking to Andrew throughout the week and and, and hearing his thoughts about. Yeah, that. Harris is going to have a million mics in his face all week long, but it is a battle of two teams. And you know what's really interesting is that. Um, you know, this line opened at just four and a half for a team that was 15 and three. That's won two great cups. I think it speaks to just how tight the Argos have played the Bombers in their limited meetings the last couple of years. I mean, if you actually broke it down, I don't think there's any team game by game that's given the Bombers more than they can handle than Toronto. And it sets up a fascinating matchup outside of the obvious storylines. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, and if you look at the history between these teams, there's not a lot of Super Bowl or Super Bowl Grey Cup history between these clubs. The last time they played in the final was the was the uh, the was it the Mud Bowl back in 1950. That was well before my time, of course, our time. Um, and so, like, I think there's a lot of history there. If you look at the market in Toronto, they do have a fan base that I think is. You know, it might not be as big in the stands, but it's certainly as passionate, I'd argue, as, as you know, as any. And I know that sounds crazy talking to Winnipeg Blue Bomber fans. No one's suggesting that Argo fans are, are better than, than Bomber fans, um, to be sure. But at the same time, and this is a, a passionate group that still draws a lot of TV numbers. There's still a lot of interest, despite, you know, not really seeing much of that dedication and effort being put in by the ownership to, to promote them. So, you know, I think this is good for them. It's certainly good for the Bombers. Um, it's good for the CFL to, to have a, you know, one dominant team and one team that, ha- you know, hasn't been there and, and two opponents that haven't seen much of each other and always seem to have good games. If you'll recall, I mean, in 2021, the only real loss that the Bombers suffered in that, you know, a season where you could argue the Bombers were even better last year than they are this year. Uh, the only loss they suffered and it was a convincing one was against, was against Toronto. And then fast forward to, to this year and, you know, again, these are all BMO field and the Argos do play well on home turf, but, you know, they were a Bo- Boris Beattie extra point away from, from tying that game and forcing overtime and potentially, you know, completing the comeback. So I, I don't think this, this is certainly not a, an easy game for the Bombers. They're definitely not looking at it as a, as an easy game. So I think this is going to be a physical, you know, physical, passionate, uh, a game between two opponents that are, that are hungry for it. And, and, uh, and, and yeah, again, just a, a terrific week to, to set these teams up for, uh, for the 109th great cup. Hey, cannot wait. Hey, just before we move on, um, you know, you mentioned great cup weeks often about much of the news around the league. Um, Hamilton getting the rights to BLM today, Bo Levi Mitchell. Um, there was a lot of thought that he might go somewhere in the West. I mean, is this a preemptive strike by the Thai cats trying to get their guy and move on from Dane Evans? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, this isn't surprising to me. I mean, I think a lot of people were focused towards, I think a lot of people were focused towards Saskatchewan just because they were such a tire fire this year. And the, you know, that one position feel like they could, you know, improving, you know, on Cody Fajardo could be the ticket. And, you know, and Bo Levi Mitchell was 
connected and tied to potentially signing with them when he came back from a few years, when it was kind of, you know, he teased this idea of maybe going to Toronto or maybe going to, to Regina and ultimately, you know, return to, to, to Calgary for a big, you know, a big sack of cash. I think that was just really to leverage his situation in Cowtown. But um, I'm not surprised because, you know, this is kind of your last couple of years. And, and that's what's interesting about this whole thing too, is Bo Levi Mitchell, like, yeah, is he an upgrade on a lot of quarterbacks? Absolutely. Is he going to have people who who are you know are going to want to maybe get into a bidding war or, or whatever for his services? Sure, but that's as much an indictment against the talent at quarterback right now in the CFL than it is you know the how much skill he has left. I mean, Bully by Mitchell got replaced this year. I mean, it wasn't like he got hurt and you know he's waiting in the wings. I mean, Jake Mayer played better than him and took his spot. So he's obviously on you know and we've seen him suffer a handful of injuries. So Anyway, it's all a roundabout way of saying that he doesn't have a ton of years left. So why would you want to go to Regina uh, and play for a Rough Riders team whose O line is absolutely horrendous, with no, with really no uh, signs that it's going to improve? Uh, get beat up there and then face all the criticism that you know that a place like that faces. Why not go to Hamilton? You know, go to a team that you know is you know is is coached by a, a well-respected guy in Orlando Steinauer. You know is going to be wanting to. Uh, get back to the dance because they're hosting the Great Cup next year, and you know, and, and surround him with good players, better players. Not to mention, you know, not, not to spoil things here, but the East sucks. So if you're if you're if you're thinking about what's your easiest route to you know to to, to the Great Cup, you're not trying to be on the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, who have to beat the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, who have to beat your former team in in Calgary. And if Nathan Rourke sticks around in BC, those are three teams that are significantly better than you and more. And, and most likely going to finish above you in the standings. That's a lot of pressure in the West. So it's no surprise to me at all that Bo Levi Mitchell would sit on, you know, sit on the opportunity here to go to Hamilton. It's near Toronto. And let's face it, I'm going to absolutely love Regina this week. I love going there for the weekend. You could not pay me absurd amount of money to live in Regina full time. I just, you know, I just can't, I couldn't, couldn't do it. So for Bo Levi Mitchell to have options. Yeah. I think, uh, I think a short drive to Toronto is a little bit more appealing than sitting on the, uh, you know, the armpit of the country. Jeff Hamilton of the Winnipeg Free Press with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk, looking ahead to the Grey Cup after the Bombers' big win in the West Final yesterday. Shout out to T. Kona Pauly. <clears throat> Thanks for the super chat, T. Kona. You got to ask me about Caleros, man. We haven't talked about his health. I will. I just got to give him a shout out. How about them, Isel, OK, and Moose? Yeah, lots of winning. Lots of winning this week. Um, Yes, Caleros, the ankle. I know it was described in the... Uh, in the piece that he has the strongest ankles, uh, he's going to need them. Um, what did you think about him not being out there at the end of the game? And I know they said, you asked him, he said, oh, I'll be there, no problem. But um, I'm going to be interested to see how active he is in practice this week, considering what happened at the end of that game. Look, I'm not here to paint like a, a horrible picture by any means. And I do tend to believe Zach when you know I asked him, I mean, Paul Friesen asked him first question, how are you feeling, right? And he took the opportunity to be like, we just want a playoff game. This is awesome. You know, we're feeling great. We're, we're so grateful. And you know what we're talking about, Zach. <laughs> totally. And then the time went down and I said, look, you know, like this is, this is, this is the number one question that all fans are going to be wanting to hear you, you know? So it's not forcing a, you know, I guess in a way it's a bit forcing an answer, but it's just, you know, what's the, are you comfortable that like, not just start next week, that everything's going to be good next week. And he said, yeah, no problem. Now, again, I tend to believe Zach for sure. I don't think it's as serious as it maybe could have been. It looks like an ankle and less of a knee. I mean, you, you, you start tweaking your knees. I think that's a little bit more challenging uh, and, and all that. So you know, I, I do think it was a good sign that, you know, look, Al Couture is one of the best, if not the best athletic therapists in the CFL. This guy takes his job incredibly serious. He would never put anybody in position to get hurt. I mean, you, you do walk a fine line in certain games and certain situations as far as that, but this is not somebody who would throw some, you know, would put somebody's health at, at, at grave risk. So the fact that they even taped up the, the ankle, put him back in. I mean, we all saw the video. He, he walked out there and, 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 and was like, no, I got to go back. This, this doesn't make any sense. Um, that is a little bit concerning to me because you know that it, it would take a lot for Zach Claris not to be on the field with his teammates in a game, in a one score game in a win or go home situation. So that is a little bit concerning, but what were you, you know, what were we expecting? You know, it, that it was an awkward looking um, play. It was an awkward looking 
uh, situation on his leg and for, you know, for him to just get up in five minutes and, and run onto the field. Like, I don't think that was, that was necessarily to be expected, but you know, I think when you look, when you look at what this next week's going to be, this is going to be the number one storyline. Are you a hundred percent? How much are you, what needs to be done? Is this nothing? Because, you know, clearly again, to my point, he didn't play the, the rest of the game in a crucial situation. So is this just a matter of it swelling up on him? Is it get a little bit of ice over the next couple of days? Mm-hmm. The bombers have, have a ton of experience with injuries over the last few years, particularly on that 2019 gray cup run. They do things, pack medical supplies, set up, you know, mini ER rooms, essentially in hotels, they will be ready. I am, I have full confidence that Zach Claris will be under center. I just don't know if I'm as confident that it'll be a hundred percent or where exactly his health status was. And I don't think we're going to get a great indication of, of that this week, no matter how many times we ask, we're going to be t- probably told it's all good. It's all whatever, but what's going to be a key indicator is what happens at practice and what we see number eight moving around. So, you know, it's certainly not good news for the bombers, but I, I, I do think it could be much worse um, just given the way we saw that play unfold and knowing how important Zach is to this team's success. Yeah, no, it's a great point. Wow, over 500 people in here, folks. Hey, hit that like button. Hit that thumbs up. I know people want to get the 300 for the suit show, which we kind of already owe you guys one. But uh, 250 special surprise unboxing at the end of the program. I haven't even told Remus about this. but There you uh, go. If everyone put $100 in right now, you'd have over 50 grand, so you'd have beer money for World Cup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly yeah i don't know i don't not sure i'm going to be jumping in on uh 40 bud zeros out yeah i'd be the, googling rules and uh and uh you know all over it you know what i mean you, you better get your people on that i got the and, direct uh, line to the canadian consulate right yeah. now to make sure everything yeah, stays go. everything stays on the up and up hey for while sure. we're here um man what a run for the jets so far um this has been You know, we knew coming back after that kind of ugly road trip where they stole five out of six points that, you know, they needed to play better. Rick Bonus said as much, and we saw a team build through the homestand, playing better through each of the three games, finishing up with that just awesome performance last Tuesday against the Dallas Stars. We knew Calgary would be hungry. It would be a very, very tough out on Saturday. They managed to get the Jets in a game that was essentially decided on special teams. Um, and then last night, a big comeback win. Blake Wheeler being the hero late, 300th goal. Um, things are rolling right now for the uh, for the Winnipeg Jets. Connor Hellebuck's been a big, big part of it. But it seems like more and more you have different guys being part of the wins night after night. And uh, sets up a pretty interesting homestand coming up, beginning with the Hall of Fame game on Thursday. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is this is a team that's having fun. I think that's the main ingredient uh, that's been that's been missing over the last couple of years. Even when they were be, even when they were you know having moments of success, I think this team is enjoying coming to the rink. I think they're enjoying playing for each other. I think they're enjoying playing for Rick Bonus and the coaching staff, which we've talked at length about. You know their ability to communicate, to make the players feel a part of it, to understand what and why they're doing things. Um, those all played into you know great success for this team. And I mean, you look at you look at whether it's um, you mentioned Blake Wheeler and, and, and what he's been able to do. I mean, I think he's playing some of his you know best hockey right now uh, without the burden of having that you know that leadership role. I mean, he still has the leadership role, but it's lead by example right now. And a lot of a lot of the inside stuff gets taken care of by guys like Adam Lowry and Josh Morrissey and Mark Shifley. And so you're definitely seeing his success come forward and his determination. And he's scoring those goals that Rick Bonus wants him to score, the whole team to score. You know, get in front of the net, play inspired hockey. And we're certainly seeing that not just from Blake Wheeler but from up and down the lineup. And again, I think it really does fr- come from understand, like showing some perspective, right? Understand, I think, I think one of Rick Bonus's greatest skills, um, assets as a head coach and go, you know, did you check, did you check out his after hours uh, over the I weekend? I did, I you know, did actually. I, I would recommend people go take a look at that. Um, I think it gives you a good insight into the man we're talking about here, not just the hockey coach. And I think when you're able to, when you're able to be that kind of human being and relay the message that you need to relay, and sometimes it's not easy, sometimes it's, uh, you know, I don't want to say aggressive, but sometimes it's, you know, negative information or whatever, you can do that a lot easier when you, when you, when you conduct yourself the way Rick Bonus conducts himself. And, and I think that's what we're seeing. Maybe that's what we were, were wondering about the entire bonus effect and, and what, what kind of power and influence you could have on this team. I think this team feels like they're all part of it. 
whether it's the you know the bottom fourth line, the bottom pairing, or the top lines. I think everybody feels like what they're doing has meaning and it has purpose. And and again, it's all wrapped up. And I think you know a, a better level of perspectives. I think a lot of these you know even in those down years where it didn't seem fun at all, I think it was easy for this team. And whether you want to call it mental strength or whatever, however you want to classify it, I think it was easy for this team to feel sorry for themselves to get angry and to be, you know, kind of revert to the individual rather than the team scope. And I, you know, whatever Rick Bonus and his staff are doing, whatever, whatever culture they're instilling, whatever morals they're, you know, you know, making sure players hold themselves to, I think is, is, is showing dividends. It's showing not just in the win loss category, it's showing abilities to claw back and not get down on each other late in games and to find ways to carve out wins that good teams do. And so it's certainly been a, you know, it's certainly been a pleasure to watch. It hasn't been, all perfect. I don't think anyone's expecting it to be perfect with the installation of new systems. The growing pains came. I'm not going to say they're not going to come anymore, but the the bomber, bombers, the Jets were able to to get through those, get through those, still rack up wins. And now we're seeing a team that is taking it personal. I mean, you you want to talk about going through individuals? I don't know if we got time, but there's a lot of guys in there that are playing some significantly great hockey. Pierre Luc Dubois. I mean, Mike Mike McIntyre called him a called him a, a, a shift disturber and a, a pain in the glass or whatever on the ice. I'll, I'll say it. The guy is an absolute shithead in the most respectful way possible. Like he's the guy, the, the way he plays is exactly the kind of player you want on your team. I mean, this is a, this is a, this is, you know, he's so such him, a pain in the ass. And I think one of the biggest differences biggest differences is is like for a long time it used to be okay Pierre-Luc Dubois was going to be playing well and Kyle Connor and then they'd slow down and it would be Mark Shifley and be Blake Wheeler and they'd be picking up the slack now you're seeing everybody kind of show up including the depth players including the defense which we know weren't generating much offense under Paul Maurice's system so to activate them the way that they're doing I think this is just you know it's fun hockey to watch it's something Sean Reynolds says on the Kenny and Rennie show all the time it's just fun hockey to watch it's it's and, and from not from this back and forth eight goals you know a, a game style it's it's about it's about having structure and and an identity and when you watch the team play you can see that they they know what they're doing that this is the blueprint to have success and it's no surprise that they're having it when they follow it yeah, and I mean they've done this with a very pedestrian goal scoring outfit by uh outfit so far from Kyle Connor. You know that's gonna come around and without Nikolai Ehlers. And I really did think the Jets, you know, missed Ehlers on Saturday night. In that sort of a game, um, mm. you know, the 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 game breaking skill and offensive talent of, of Nikolai Ehlers was missing, and you know, they'll only be a better team when he gets back. Couple of interesting comments here in the chat. SK, this is my favorite jet season ever due to Bones. He's completely changed the mindset of the players. He thinks he would coach any team to success. He's got these guys believing. Certainly does seem like he's getting full, full buy-in right now from uh from the squad. Um, and overall, uh, by the way, you were mentioning um <laughs> you were mentioning Pierre Luc Dubois. Uh, Rennie last night on the post game show, I got such a kick out of this, called him a high IQ pest because he is doing things to help his team win and he's getting under the skin of opponents and it is turning into opportunities. I mean, hell, I mean, the biggest regret I think the Jets had was not making more of the opportunity that he created late in the second period to give them a five on three power play on Saturday night and then, you know, to give up the winner shorthanded to Trevor Lewis, I think was a bit of a bitter pill to swallow. Uh, but then it goes back to last night, uh, Jeff, that, you know, everyone was thawing out from the, from the football game and turned on the tube and saw the jets, you know, down late in the game, they continue to put on and took advantage of another stupid penalty drawn by guess who Pierre Luc Dubois to tie that game and end up getting a big, big two points. Well, yeah, you, as you mentioned, that high IQ, uh, yeah, that was certainly in play when uh, <laughs> Pierre-Luc Dubois was delivering the lumber uh, prior to getting punched in the back of the head there. So, I mean, there were certainly some plays there. You probably could have penalized uh, Dubois a couple times on that shift, but yeah, absolutely um, savvy move not to get busted by the referees. And um, he's the kind of guy that, like, he'll take advantage of any small crack. You know, he'll he'll do the thing where, you know, he'll he'll – 
face wash a guy or, or, you know, he'll do the same thing, right? He's not doing it from behind the head. He's usually doing it when he's, you know, looking at you, but he's certainly taken full advantage of that and, and, and draws penalty. But you got to remember, this is the guy who had the most penalties last year in the NHLs and drew, I think drew the and most. Drew the most. <laughs> so it was like, you know, <laughs> on you brand, know, you give, you take. So, um, but yeah, it's all about finding that fine line. And, and ultimately you saw the pat, you see the passion from, him. I think that's what endeared, uh, you know, Pierre-Luc Dubois to a lot of a lot of fans last season after, you know, and no surprise or no secret here, not a great first year with, with Winnipeg. So for him to answer back in the way he did last season and then, then to show the the passion and the, you know, give a give a whatever meter through the roof. I mean, that's what that's what Winnipeg fans want, man. That I mean, I talked to a lot of them and you know, of course they want the wins. Of course they want to be able to tell you know, the rest of the league, how, how good their team is and whatnot. But ultimately, they want to see players care. And, and certainly that's something that you can't uh, you can't debate um, with Pierre Dubois and having it. Well, another huge sports week uh, coming up. Uh, obviously, Jets off for a couple days. They'll practice, get ready for the Hall of Fame game when Team Mussolini and Tempo Newman will be honored into the Jets Hall of Fame. And then a Saturday night game against Sidney Crosby and the Penguins on Hockey Night in Canada, followed up by the Bombers going for the three-peat. And, oh, let's not forget about a young man named Connor Bedard coming in to take on the number one team in Canadian junior hockey in the Winnipeg Ice. Um, when are you, uh, when are you uh, leaving? When are you heading out there? Wednesday? I already got, no, 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 tomorrow morning. I got my... Right uh, early. I've already picked up the rental. Uh, there's, a, there's a, there's, it's a seven-seater. So we'll, we'll we'll packing that in. We're gonna you know we're gonna bring the uh, we're gonna split a vehicle with the the sun guys. So there's gonna be a group of us. So uh, get on the Instagram. We're gonna uh, oh, dust yes. dust off that baby and do a little Jeff and Ted's uh, take on Jeff and Ted uh, rolling with Cup. a bit of a bigger crew. The crew is bigger deeper crew. this year for mm-hmm, the uh, for mm-hmm. the Grey Cup. Yeah, and so uh, we'll try to do- we'll try to document as much of the fun as we have to a certain degree, and then uh, yeah, it's, uh, like as you can tell, I'm I'm. I'm buzzing for this show because I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, to the upcoming week here. Well, we may need to lean on you. Maybe get a a, a, a repeat visit later on this week with all the uh, fun you guys are having out in Regina. I'm certainly uh, missing it, although for a good reason. But um, I know I wouldn't be surprised if about half of that stadium that was there cheering on the Bombers is actually in Mosaic. And I'm very interested to see how much of a home field advantage the Bombers will have in Saskatchewan uh, because obviously there's tons of people that take in the Grey Cup that, you know, are with other teams that won't have a direct rooting interest. But I think with the amount of Saskatchewan folks that are selling their tickets, the uh, majority of those are going to be sold to people from Manitoba wearing blue and gold on Sunday at Mosaic. Yeah, I certainly think that that market is uh, is certainly going to fatten up with some Winnipeg fans as, as you know, we're, we're driving distance away from Regina. And, and uh, you know, again, talking about chasing history here, right? I, already, I don't necessarily think it eliminates the fact that the Bombers era right now could be considered a dynasty if they lose, but it certainly helps cement that if they win. And um, yeah, if you want to, if you want to talk more football or whatever, it's uh, it's a beauty that you have a one to three show because back when 1290 was still in existence, I used to use them as my alarm clock in the morning, you know, waking up from the, <laughs> from the great cup mornings and being like, oh yeah, I got a radio hit. Let's see if I can pull this one off. So uh, certainly looking forward to things and, and we'll see, I think there's going to be a lot of blue. I think there's going to be uh, a lot of people cheering on the, on the bombers and there's probably going to be a lot of, you know, Saskatchewan fans that are going to put their, uh, their Argo hats on for, for uh, a brief spell to hope, hope that the bombers can, and we didn't talk about this officially own mosaic stadium yes but not just the preseason win not just the regular first regular season win not just the first playoff win but potentially the first gray cup victory on that field <laughs> while in saskatchewan rough riders dressing room that's got to be a tough pill to swallow for the for our friends out uh, out west there that's the that's the final act on the contract for full and complete ownership of the uh, city of regina and mosaic field by the winnipeg blue bombers can't wait for it pal have a great time we'll miss you guys out there have one for me drive safe and uh hopefully we can catch up later on this week yeah Huss, you'll certainly be missed we've had some great times with the great cup in the past but uh i'll i'll, I'll, uh, I'll see what i can do on behalf of both of us <laughs> good stuff there it is jeff hamilton again check out the piece from saturday free press on zach caleros just uh so well done and really really interesting i think for all sorts of bomber fans uh and of course you may be wondering if you don't know Huss, what the heck you're not going to a uh, regina no i will be in Doha, Qatar, getting ready for the World Cup, which begins a week today. And 
we're going to talk about Canada's team coming up in just a couple minutes. By the way, shout out to everyone that hit the like. We will do a little unboxing at the end of the program after we hit the cool bet lines. Uh, but first, I got to thank our friends at Princess Auto and everyone that stepped up at that Princess Auto tailgate zone yesterday. I did a little video for our friends at Cool Bet, just a bit of a scene setter and got so many comments from people as to just how electric it looked. And this was before the game even started. Um, what a season it's been at that Princess Auto tailgate zone. And now one more win, and we'll have to recreate that Princess Auto tailgate zone for Bomber fans outside of Mosaic before the big game on Sunday. Of course, Princess Auto, great sponsors of Winnipeg Sports Talk, as well as the two-time defending Grey Cup champion, Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And of course, Princess Auto is the place where you find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Two Winnipeg locations, Panit Road, Portage Avenue West. And you can always shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. I have a feeling there was a lot of people needing quite a bit of the good stuff from our friends at Culligan Water after the game and certainly this morning after waking up after that Sunday here in Winnipeg. Culligan have been the water experts taking care of Manitobans for over 65 years in business. And they really do have everything that you might need when it comes to water and water products. They've got softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems, and drinking water systems not to mention citywide water delivery services and commercial and industrial water products and solutions. Whatever your water needs, the Culligan man has you covered. Pop down and see them. 1200 Sergeant Avenue. You can give them a call at 694-5180 and you can check them out online at drinkculligan.com. Uh, I got to give a shout out to our pal Gitch. Travis Spratt, who I saw as well. Bunch of WSTers and a bunch of them we're all enjoying the Canadian Club and Ginger Ale, which of course was available throughout the stadium and out in the tailgate zone. And uh, let's just say sales were brisk. If you haven't tried it already, what are you waiting for? The great taste of CC and ginger, pre-made, ready to go, available now in cans at your local beer store. And of course, with the holidays just around the corner, not to mention the Grey Cup, you're definitely going to want to pop by your local Manitoba Liquor Marts and get Canada's favorite Canadian whiskey for Grey Cup Sunday and the holidays ahead. Canadian club, official spirit of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and official spirit of Winnipeg Sports Talk. And hey, we got Monday Night Football tonight. I know our friends at BP were busy, busy yesterday going from the Bomber game to the Jet game last night. Uh, and it just keeps on going because, of course, Boston Pizza is the place where you can win a trip for two to Vegas for New Year's Eve weekend to see the Niners and Raiders play at Allegiant Stadium and a bonus NHL game between the Blues and the Vegas Golden Knights. And when you pop in, you can try some of these new favorites on the BP Fall menu, including the craveable jalapeno popper dip, spicy buffalo mac and cheese, and the creamy carbonara pizza tonight. Eagles and Commanders pop by your local Boston pizza with your chance to win that great grand prize of a trip to Vegas and try that new fall menu. Um, all right, let's get Remus in here for a minute. Remo, before we, um, before we get to Rob Gale, I just want to sort of want to wrap this bomber conversation with a few of the quotes from Mike O'Shea. And I know you've got those clips ready. Um, if we can, uh, you know, because obviously we're going to be spending a lot of time looking ahead to the Grey Cup. Um, but I did want to include a couple of these quotes from the coach, as well as Zach Caleros after the game, after the Bombers booked their ticket to the third straight. Um, here is Mike O'Shea. We'll go with number one right off the bat. Mike O'Shea on making it to the big dance for the third consecutive year. Mike, in the moment, what does it mean to go to a third straight Grey Cup? Yeah. <laughs> Can I hear it? It means we're going to a Grey Cup. <laughs> That's all it means. Uh, try not to confuse the issue, right? It's not one or two or three or four. It's, it's this one. It's just we get to practice another week. Uh, the, the game will figure itself out later in the week, but right now we've got to clean this film up and, you know, Enjoy tonight, but get back to work tomorrow. 
Martin or Mike O'Shea on, uh, you know, making it to the third straight Grey Cup. And again, before we focus all our attention on Sunday, here's what the Bomber head coach had to say about last night's win for his club on home field. As an, as an odd a game as you'd ever see unfold, really. It just was... It's hard to describe, really. There was just so many little things going on throughout the game that prevented you from, you know, taking hold. Um, I'm sure they believe they missed some opportunities too, but I think we missed some opportunities. Um, I mean, the, the win is, is great, um, especially surviving some of those things, you know. Um, it's good. we got a good football team, so they're able to do that. I'd just like to see it a little cleaner, that's for sure. All right, there's the coach, the mastermind of uh, this bomber run, looking to make it three straight great cups on Sunday against the Toronto Argonauts in Regina. Um, of course, there was quite a bit of concern about Zach Caleros. I see Dave Naylor reporting that there should not be any concern about Zach Caleros. I'm still going to, we'll see what happens in practice this week, but you know he's going to be out there. Here is the MOP and the Bombers starting quarterback with his thoughts after uh, beating the BC Lions for another trip to the championship. Feeling good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, for this organization to, to be going back, you know, three times in a row, it's pretty unbelievable. So just really happy, um, really grateful, as I talked about the other day, to be a part of it. Um, happy for the guys in the locker room. It's a total team effort uh, per usual. And uh, just an unbelievable atmosphere that uh, our fans brought. And it was... Uh, just amazing. All right. There is Zach Caleros uh, post game yesterday. We'll hear much more from the Bombers throughout the week as they head to Regina looking to make it three straight Grey Cups for the first time any team has done it since the early 1980s. All right. Well, while well, the Grey Cup will dominate the headlines as well as a big week for the Winnipeg Jets, we can't forget that Canada is back in the World Cup. The squad was named yesterday. And no better person to talk about it with than our good friend Rob Gale, former Valor FC head coach who spent many years coaching the national junior team and with 16 of the 26 young men named to represent our country at the World Cup have played for Rob. So uh, let's welcome in Rob Gale from New York City to get the latest on Canada heading to Qatar. Gailey, what's up, my man? How are you? Very well, Huss. How are you doing, my friend? Oh, I could not be more excited about the upcoming World Cup. Listen, it's just a great time to be here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Jets and Bombers are doing great. And, of course, if you are a soccer fan or be going to become one in a week, Canada's back in the World Cup since for the first time since 1986. So much fun. Hey, listen, before we get to the squad and look ahead to Qatar, I know people will be very interested as to what you're up to right now. Um, you're quite busy out in the Big Apple. Fill us in on what you've got going on. Yeah, uh, exciting stuff, mate. Nice new challenge, new area to be in and uh, in the big market. So uh, doing some technical director work for a National Centre of Excellence, um, working on sort of developing their curriculum and, and, and players in the Northeast, um, and then also working with New York City Football Club uh, as part of the City Football Group. And what a great ownership group to to be involved with, you know, worldwide and, and, and the quality of the clubs and just the sheer size and scale of that. Um, it, it's a great opportunity for me to to continue to be on the field and, and work with emerging talent uh, and, and the many possibilities and pathways off of that with the City Group. Well, speaking of emerging talent, it's sort of a great segue into talking about Canada's national team that will be representing the red and white overseas at the World Cup in the fact that more than half of the players on Canada were your former players when you coached the junior. Before we talk about the squad, give us a little <laughs> bit of a background for people that don't know about your working with the Canadian program and how many of these young men were at one point pupils of Rob Gale. <laughs> yeah, very fortunate, mate. Uh, like you say, it was almost like a proud popper moment and, and any coach really that, that that's had any role in, in, in youth development. It's, it's a privilege uh, to be in those positions and then to see players reach their full potential and to get an opportunity to play at the World Cup. You're so proud of them. And I was lucky enough from 2009, uh, right the way up until last year, still doing some work with the Canadian Soccer Association to work with 
the under-17 youth national team. We went to two youth World Cups, uh, which obviously players like Samuel Piet and Max Crapo, uh, who just broke his leg, he actually done something very similar uh, in that under-17 World Cup against Uruguay, and he did in the MLS Cup final. So, you know, there, there's so many stories. And after the under-17s, I worked with the 18s and, and was head coach of the under-20s and then worked with every team from 15 to 23. So... You know, 16 out of those lads I've had the pleasure to work with closely. Some of them was involved in the discussions to bring them into Canada and not play for other national teams. And, you know, it, it's so rewarding that now they're, they're there at the World Cup and I'm just excited to, to see, them, see them play and so proud of how far they've taken themselves. You know, Alfonso Davies certainly has the biggest star power, I would say, worldwide of the uh, Canadian team. But, I mean, there's a number of any, if you've been paying attention at all, uh, you're quite familiar with the number of the young men that uh, will be representing Canada. But, I mean, let's just go through this roster a little bit. Forwards, um, Alfonso Davy, Davies, Jonathan David, Kyle Laren, Tejon Buchanan, all of those guys had huge, huge parts of getting Canada to Qatar. Yeah, and what's great about all those lads is the day-to-day -day environments they're in, right? And 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 for us as Canada soccer, we have many, many years where the, the joke internally was they're playing for Sands Club. They had no professional club. We didn't have those environments, you know, and it's so hard to qualify for these events if they don't have experiences of past youth tournaments of, of, of top-level football. But uh, like you say, Liam Miller is a Bay at Basel. Uh, Ek Ukbo is playing his trade in Europe. Tejon Buchanan at Bruges. Jonathan David, you know, um, top goal scorer in League One just a couple of seasons ago when Neymar and all of them are competing against him. Kyle Larin, who'd done very well at Basictus and has now moved on with Tejon. You know, there's there's some great day-to-day -day environments and really if you look at our squad that is that is our ultimate strength we look very very dangerous in the attacking unit and will cause all teams that we face uh problems there's no doubt about that we'll ask questions you know i'm just looking at the midfielder list and of course jonathan asorio has been a huge part of this club but uh, we pretty much should start with atiba hutchinson i mean how much has this man meant to canadian soccer over the years and um for everyone that's involved that's had a piece of this, I'm sure it's extra special to see him get to the World Cup finally after so many tours of duty with the national squad. Yeah, to a man, woman, and child, I think anyone who's been involved in the program um, is so pleased for Atiba. And if this is to be his swan song, what a fitting swan song. He is an absolute legend. It's, it's scandalous, really, how much attention he's got over the years for someone to compete at his level and be so dominant and he's absolutely beloved in turkey and at basictus and um you know people don't know of him in his own country if it was a you know a nfl star or a nhl player this guy you know would have serious celebrity status but testament to the man as well he doesn't seek that he goes about his job he's a great role model he is the leader of the squad he is the oldest player actually competing at the world cup as well um and everyone's excited for him. He, he means so much to the pro, the program. And he's not there as a token either. He, he, he is still fantastic on the field and very much the leader on and off of it. You know, um, uh, obviously, uh, Stephen Estacchio will be a big part of it. I mean, who are the guys that, you know, at the midfield position that Canada and John Hurden will really be leaning on once we get to uh, the Belgium game? Yeah, I think you can't go past Hutchison and Estacchio. He's in great goal-scoring form. Um uh, over in Porto uh, and and a key part and he, he another one that we convinced over the years to come to um, Canada soccer and what a great addition for us and then you know it's going to depend after that you've got some versatile players obviously Ismail Kone is getting a lot of interest at the moment from Montreal there's top European clubs looking at him he has an X factor he just scored against Qatar in the friendly last week um, he's only got four caps, so I don't expect, you know, him to, to start necessarily, but I think he can be dynamic off the field and you've got excellent players in Piet, Fraser, uh, Mark Anthony Kay, uh, Jonathan Osorio that lots of people know has always come up trumps in the big moments for TFC. They're, they're obviously at excellent MLS level players and between them, it's just finding that right balance 
to to sort of match the explosive talent we have ahead and maybe the uh, defensive uh, frailties we might have behind that, um, which is everyone's concern with Canada, I think. So the midfield balance is, is going to be a key thing. Well, Rob Gale's with us breaking down Canada's squad for the World Cup, which begins next week in Qatar. Uh, we always uh, remember uh, Atakubi's incredible celebration in Edmonton into the snowbank. Um, he's part of a, a group of defenders that certainly are going to have their hands full right out of the gate with the team, a powerhouse like Belgium. Um, uh, fill us in on uh, the star defenders and who will be uh, getting that responsibility of trying to uh, keep a clean sheet in front of Milan Borian. Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Obviously, Daniil Henry, uh, unfortunately, got injured at the end there. And um, I would say if you look at it, the standout name is obviously uh, Stephen Vittori. He's the most experienced. We're going to rely heavily on him in the middle of the park uh, at the back there. I could honestly see us playing a back three and, uh, and, and having Kamal Miller on the left side of that. Alistair Johnson more as a, a wing back. Sam Adekugbe who can do that. Obviously, Alfonso could do that, but the higher up the field, the better for us. So, again, it, it, it's tough. Richie Luray has been fantastic. It didn't work out for him in Nottingham Forest, but he's been fantastic in the MLS with TFC. Um, and they're great, great lads. And then, obviously, Joel Wartman's a great story, having come through college soccer, playing for TSS Rovers out in, in British Columbia before being drafted in the... In the U Sports CPL draft, I remember him. All of us watching him and, and wanting him, and, and Cavalry got an early pick to to bring him, and they obviously had him at the the foothills as well. So he's had a meteoric rise, as has Alistair Johnson. We got a lot of young, willing guys there, but yeah, you're up against De Bruyne and uh, Luka Modric, an absolute world class player. So. It's going to be challenging and it's going to need to be, as it has been throughout the brotherhood and, and, and the quality of the group, 26 strong to, to try and get us in a position to hopefully get our first result. And I think John Herman said it best. He goes, we're not, they'll have internal expectations for sure. Knowing John and the group, uh, they believe that they can get out of the group. Um, but step by step, first goal at a World Cup, first result, all of those things are, are going to be important stepping stones on this, the greatest of sort of staging posts. Well, and one of the other stars of the club, and in some ways almost seems like one of the emotional leaders of the club, is the last line of defense in Milan Borjan. Uh, what, what does he mean to this club right now? Um, and how much is going to be on his shoulders once they get to Qatar? I think his pants have their own Twitter handle now, <laughs> don't they, boy? Uh, uh, boy, Milan's pants, Borjan's pants. And a great Winnipeg connection. I don't know if people know that with uh, Milan and his dad used to coach here and he had some time in Winnipeg as a youth. So um, another a great story uh, for us there uh, to follow along with. But um, as long as, as well as James Pantemis, obviously, who I brought into the Canadian Premier League and, and delighted to see him get the call up. There he is, boy, hands, pants, look. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> the, uh, the fellas, uh, you know, Milan is... He's done fantastically in Europe. He's a legend back there. Um, he's a great personality. And you can see when they get the huddle and the circle, he, he's the he's the voice. As much as Atiba's probably the leader with his actions and his day-to-day -day behaviors, uh, Milan's the voice of the dressing room and, and, and the spirit behind it. And you, you can see how much it means to him and a lot of part of his career. So we're going to need him. We're going to need him to come up big at the right moments like any goalie in the, in the tournament. Um, and like I say, hopefully the, the 10 guys in front can protect him as much as possible as well. So, uh, Rob, when, uh, when our lads get there and are preparing for Belgium in the first game, um, what, what's the message to, uh, to all of them? Um, because uh, listen, Canada got there last in 1986. They didn't win a game. They didn't score a goal. Expectations are different, but Man, you go into it playing a world powerhouse right off the bat. But um, just, you know, thoughts on how they approach that first game and the tournament overall. And then we'll get to your expectations or what's possible for this Canadian team. Yeah, so I think, you know, John is a master of the preparation and, and the detail needed. It'll, it'll, they'll have done the work extensively with his backroom staff to prepare detailed analysis of every opponent and, and, and also 
the rotation and, and the balance of what we need in each and every game. It, there won't be any stone left unturned there. But honestly, I think the mentality is it's a free hit. We haven't been here. We've, we've brought the country on a journey. Um, the interest has never been greater in Canadian soccer. We're, we're going to be back at the next one as hosts. So enjoy the experience. I think they'll have healthy respect, obviously, for the opposition. But the great part about this group is, is they can play without fear. They know they've got talent. Um, and just go out and make the most of the experience. Don't leave anything. You know, they won't leave anything to chance off the field. And don't leave anything out there when you're there. Give it your all and know that the country and everyone is behind you. And any, honestly, any result, any goal, I think is going to be celebrated. Yeah, because it's a it's a landmark moment for male soccer in in our country. Um, we know the Belgians are a world powerhouse, and that's game number one. What do we know about the Croatians and the Moroccans, who will be games two and three for Canada? And, I mean, do you give them a shot to getting some of those results and being in the mix to potentially moving out of the group? Look, I'm biased. I uh, and, and rightfully so. I'm proud to be biased. I do give us a chance. I think Croatia is getting old. I think they were lucky against England. And I'm going to put that right out there now. <laughs> <laughs> After coming back in that, we should have had it signed, sealed and delivered. I was ready to fly to Russia for the final four years ago. So, um no, no uh, malice there towards the Croatians <laughs> for me at all. But uh, no, I think they, they've got talent, obviously, but they're not as good as they were four years ago. Um, I've got some world-class players, but it's not one you look at and like the Belgium squad and the depth and think, oh my goodness, you know what I mean? That is going to be a, a very difficult test, no doubt about it. And players are in off-season, MLS players, you know, we're not in the same form and, and fitness as, as other countries. So I think those European players are going to have to step up big for us. But Croatia, talented squad, I think beatable. Definitely our attack will give them problems. We'll need to be resolute in the transitional moments in the defence. And then Morocco is a tough one. You know, I wouldn't look past them. I'd almost count that as uh, possibly tougher than... Um, Croatia, which, would be, you know, people won't necessarily think that, but we've played against North African teams, youth levels, senior levels, technically very, very astute. Um, they'll be used to playing in the heat. So I, th I think that's a, that's a challenging game, but one that I, I think we can get points on. I think there's two, two of the three games I would, I would be uh, putting a few quid on the, England uh, on, on the Canada team and uh, and making making that bet because I think we can upset and surprise a few people. Rob Gale's with us, getting ready for Canada's return to the World Cup next week, beginning in Qatar. Um, Rob, outside of the Canadians, who are the uh, who are the teams that you're most looking forward to seeing? Who uh, and is do you have is there a clear favorite right now, or is mm. it just a group of the super elite teams in the, in the world that will probably be determining for the uh, the trophy at the end of it all? Yeah, I, I think that it, it it's hard to tell and what kind of shape teams come in at, uh, and and obviously a shortened amount of time. Uh, it's hard to look past the two South American teams in Argentina and Brazil. The sheer squad depth, obviously, Argentina won the Copa last year with Messi and it's his swan song. So there's, you know, the the football purists who who would like to see that um, and reward uh, kind of like when Ronaldo won the, uh, the Euros uh, a few years back with Portugal. I think France, Portugal, England will be in and around it because of their last couple of, of tournaments and the expectation there. But for me, when it goes to these hot countries and, and climates, it, it's very rare a European team does does the business. Um, it's not unheard of, but it, it, it's rare over the course of history. So my money would be on the South Americans um, and just the sheer quality of those squads. But it will be, like you say, for me, those, those sort of top eight teams in the world uh, who have had success and, and reached latter stages of tournaments you need to know what that takes to be able to go there and, and do that again. Uh, Rob, before we go, I mean, you mentioned having coached 16 of the 26 men that will be representing the country. How special is it going to be for you on uh, 
game number one, I believe the 23rd, when Canada's out there in the World Cup for the first time since uh, 1986 with all these young men that you've put so many hours in with. Yeah, you, you know me, Huss, I'm an emotional guy and cry at flipping uh, Hallmark movies. So uh, <laughs> there'd, be a, there'd be a tear in my eye for sure just to see him out there and, and representing. And even, you know, when I stand up and sing the national anthem when I was a head coach standing on the, on the line there and being a Canadian myself, it, it means something special. But to see that at the World Cup and, and these young lads who we've known since 14, 15 years of age, going out and giving their all and representing the country. And I know they'd do, they'd do us all proud. So can't wait. Looking forward to it. Nine days can't come soon enough. And uh, let's hope we uh, cause a few problems for Belgium in that opening game and take it from there. Amen to that. Rob, it is so great to catch up with you. All the best out in uh, the Big Apple with uh, New York City Football Club. And uh, I know you'll be pulling for uh, Team Canada when things get going next week in guitar. Hopefully we can catch up maybe at some point over the tourney for a little bit more of your wit and wisdom here on WST. Allez la rouge. <laughs> All right, good stuff with Gailey. Great to hear him uh, having such a great time working with NYCFC and... Uh, Obviously, as I mentioned, just like a proud papa with all of his uh, former members of the Canadian junior team now representing our country in the World Cup, which begins next week in Qatar. I'll be joining the show, well, hopefully doing the show as normal. We'll see how that all works, but um, there'll be plenty of content from Winnipeg Sports Talk on my Twitter and Instagram. And of course, make sure you're following the Cool Bet Canada socials on Instagram and Twitter for uh, all the sights and sounds of uh, everything we get up to in Qatar for the World Cup. Really looking forward to that. Got to give a shout out to Nick and Nikki DQ. Bumped into Nick on the weekend. He was doing a little bit of off-season golf training and then uh, having a couple out at uh, a very famous St. James watering hole. Shout out to the guys at the Silver Heights. Uh, but they're busy right now, folks. Of course, it's still, it's always a great time for the best ice cream treat around the world famous blizzard all the great flavors that you've enjoying this summer are still there for you right now including a few new ones as we head into the holidays not to mention the amazing stack burgers if you have not tried them what are you waiting for new buns sauces and more they are phenomenal for nick and nicky dqs dq niverville dq northgate dq polo park and dq st anne's pop by tell them the boys at Winnipeg Sports Talk sent you. And, of course, if you do need a DQ ice cream cake for an upcoming event, you can hit them up on Instagram at DQ Manitoba. Let them know what you're looking for. Send them a pic. They'll get it done for you for a quick and easy pickup at any of the four Nick and Nikki DQ locations. And for those of you that are with us live on YouTube and you missed this before, I'm just putting into the chat right now the link for a little very quick survey from Little Brown Jug. Um, you could win the ultimate Grey Cup prize pack from Little Brown Jug, including $125 of beer and a $100 Smitty's gift card for some party eats to one lucky winner. All you got to do is just fill out that short survey. If you're listening to us on the podcast, you can check our Twitter. The post was up on uh, Friday. Maybe we'll boost that today. And our Instagram page as well, at Sports Talk WPG. Pop in there, let them know that you love Little Brown Jug and uh, you heard it here on Winnipeg Sports Talk if you can. And uh, one of our lucky listeners will be winning that great prize pack for the Grey Cup, including Winnipeg's favorite beer, Little Brown Jug. We're picking a winner on Thursday, so you've got three days to fill the survey. Let any other friends know uh, this is uh, where to go. And um, as I said, if you're listening on the podcast, check out our socials for the link to that. Or you can get to the YouTube show and the link will be in the description right here. Big thanks to Little Brown Jug. And don't forget, stuck up on that Little Brown Jug before Grey Cup weekend, either at the brewery and tap room downtown on William Avenue by calling for delivery or online delivery at littlebrownjug.ca or popping by and grabbing Little Brown Jug at your favorite local beer store. Uh, all right. Whoa, Remo, we got to 300 likes. Sh suit week. I don't know if I'm ready for that, but okay. I'm I'm in. I'm definitely in for in for one of those. Do we have an NFT Marvel, <laughs> Bridget? <laughs> uh, yes. And big guy, 
Looks like WST will be experiencing an often discussed topic when they go to Qatar. Time zones. Yes, eight hours difference. So a live show at 1 is 9 p.m. there. Um, and as I said, we'll probably record a bunch of stuff earlier on in the day, depending on what we're able to do. But uh, as I said, Remo's back. He's, you know, he's had two weeks off, just lazing around, doing nothing, of course. Oh, actually, probably not that case. Uh, but he'll 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 be on it. And uh, I, you probably have two weeks worth of takes stored up as well now that you're back on the show. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I actually put some of those takes on our uh, TikTok. Uh, so go to our TikTok. I TikTok put my, guy. I'm big. I put a nice sure. video. Uh, it's in the description. Uh, what sports talk WPG on TikTok? Uh, my hot takes on the board ads, and I did my reverse retro rankings. Got a lot of action on there. I was pretty surprised. But uh, yeah, I, you know, I kind of feel like um, Connor Hellbuck last year. We all know that he had a new child last year, and we talked about if it affected his play. You know, he was instead of being the best goal in the league, he was like only top ten. Uh, so I'm <laughs> I'm debating. Uh, I'm wondering how it's going to affect my performance, uh, my performance going forward. We'll have to see. Well, we haven't had any uh, mutes or anything today. So, we just um, had one minor one, actually. Oh, right, we right just there. did. Okay, I was not aware of that. But uh, anyways, it's been great to have you back. And just quickly, before we do the cool bet lines, uh, we've spent so much time on the Bombers. Obviously, that was the main story. They're going back to the Great Cup. But uh, what did you think of the Jets weekend? Uh, what stood out to you? I got a couple of things. Instead of one, the power play especially in that game against Calgary, you know, when you can't score on the power play and you give up a shorthanded goal to Jets legend, Trevor Lewis, what a, mo <laughs> what a move. Okay. This is what I said. I said, wrote in the notes, Jets legend, Trevor Lewis scored the winner. And then Jets hall of famer, Brandon Tanev with the late go ahead goal on, on uh, yesterday. Um, I, one thing I liked uh, in Calgary, Adam Lowry showing some aggressiveness. I love that face off win where he just ran the guy, ran the guy over. Um, Cole Perfetti's been taking these bad hits all all year. He, he had another one. He had enough. He, he took a bad cross checking penalty, but like, <clears throat> league's got to protect these guys on these hits from behind. You saw it again yesterday. Nate Schmidt took one, and the whole team's just like, we we can't take this anymore. And they all, even Blake Wheeler took a double minor and jumped on jumped on the guy. Um, well, Wheeler got a little unhinged in that play. Well, they, to be honest, I was watching this, and you know it was going to be coincidentals, and then Blake got in there, and Blake got really aggressive. And I mean, we can debate whether the call was right, but you know, it's not too often you see a team get a four-minute penalty out of something like that. And I'll say this about Wheels: I have a feeling he was probably not too pleased with certainly the result of what happened while he was sitting in the box. He came out right after that, Remo, and looked vintage Wheeler taking the puck to the net, barely missing a goal, um, and then was front and center right in the dying seconds of the game when uh, he got number 300 and took that one to OT before our team scoring leader, Josh Morrissey, set up yeah. Mark Shifley on a beautiful two-on-one to get the full two points after just about leaving the weekend with zero. Yeah, Josh Morrissey, the team scoring leader, one goal, 14 assists. I can't believe, uh, believe that. Neil Pionk also passed last year's goal total. He scored his fourth of the year on the weekend. Um, you know, this Carson Soucy, play him and PLD getting into it in front of the net, 24 seconds left, and Soucy goes and hits... PLD in the back of the head with a sucker punch. I mean, such a coward move, punching a guy. I mean, at least slash him in the leg or stick him in the balls, but a punch to the back of the head. Uh, so that's out of line. Two men. That would cost you $2,500. Yeah, it cost by 20. NHL player safety. And the Jets tied up with four seconds left. I mean, what a joke play. Like, who does that punch? Like, who, like why? What's the point of that? You could have won the game and uh, well, lost it. was incredibly farm. stupid, but as Rennie referred to PLD, a uh, high IQ pest. And, uh, hey, he ended up being a real difference maker on the weekend. I liked his game in Calgary, really liked his game in yesterday in Seattle. And, of course, was the uh, was the guy that drew the penalty that allowed the Jets back in to uh, tie that up in the dying seconds and then win the game in overtime. Um, I mean, listen, a nice bounce back. Uh, we saw Wheeler. And big save, Dave got the jacket as well last night, Remo. I know there was a lot of people that were basically done with Dave after one period. I said, hey, can we pump the brakes a little bit and just see what happens over a few starts? Um, listen, I think he was played very well in the game against Arizona, keeping them in and winning an OT. And then 
doing the same thing last night when his team needed them uh, to uh, to keep them in in the third third period. Kind of funny. I know it's very very small sample size, but uh, you know we're all saying at the beginning of the year Comrie's off to the hot start. Oh, he should have got Comrie and uh, big save. Dave's Lots not getting of it done. Takes. And now Comrie, look, Comrie's no, got the worst numbers now. I know he's played more games than Dave, but I think Dave is serviceable goalie, and he's come in. And he's got uh, got two wins here, so uh, nice. Nice uh, win for him. Um, trying to think if I have any other another thing that I wrote down. Um, I mean, they did just got. I mean, it was nice to see them actually call penalties. Us. I know the Jets had a lot of power plays, but which ones of those weren't penalties? Like Susie, uh, what punching him in the back of the head? That's a penalty. I know it's they don't want to call a penalty with twenty four seconds well, left. Hey, but they called it both ways. At, they called it both ways. They at, gave Wheeler the double minor yeah. in that mix up, and uh, I, I I had no issue with it. The funny penalty of the entire one, and this was one that the Jets really let get away, mm -hmm. another PLD special, drawing the penalty on the power play late in the second period to put the Jets up five on three, and that was just straight up uh, frustration from the Calgary Flames. I believe, was it Tandem? No, it was Rasmus Anderson. They'd hit him sort of close to Markstrom, and then Markstrom just stuck out his leg and tripped him. PLD was not pleased about it, but... They got the five on three. Unfortunately, the Jets didn't make them pay on that five on three. And then, as you mentioned, gave up the shorthanded winner to Jets legend Trevor Lewis, as you uh, yeah. coined earlier today. The, po the power play on Saturday really struggled. They, I mean, there was a period where they didn't get any shots, including on that five on three. That play was very weirdly described on the broadcast. Um, <laughs> uh, they did a really nice job breaking it down with Kelly Rudy and Bieksa on intermission. But during the, the play... I wasn't sure if they watched the same thing. They said that Dubois shot the puck like at towards Markstrom, where he clearly sh shoveled it into the corner, and Anderson like Dubois was skating in the corner, and Anderson came in and nudged him into his own goalie, and Markstrom stuck out the leg. I think it was pretty obvious, but the, the broadcast team they they missed that one, and I was sitting there watching it, being like, "Are these guys watching the same thing?" And I had to tweet about it, and seemingly everyone else saw. Thought for what happened, and I was happy that Dubois didn't go to the box because sometimes the refs they don't see these things the right way, and the wrong guy gets a penalty. And uh, nice job there, uh, given Markstrom uh, the two minutes in. You know, the, maybe if Markstrom doesn't make that crazy save on Mark Scheifele in the first period, oh! we're talking about uh, talking about a Jets win or at least overtime because that was that looked like a free goal for Scheifele and Markstrom made some uh, crazy. Remind me of Trevor Kidd in a Flames uniform in the early nineties. <laughs> Our boy Kidder. Yeah. You know, as far as the Calgary game goes, um, I actually like the Jets the way they played it for uh, five on five. I thought they were able to, for the most part, answer the physicality of the Calgary Flames. I loved Lowry flattening Lucic when Lucic was the aggressor on that play. Um, and Lucic wasn't having any of it. Uh, and you know what? And I think there that is one of those tough games for a guy like Cole Perfetti. So young, not very big. He is going to be a target. And, uh, you know, there was the one cheap shot, I thought, from Richie earlier on in the game that was called. Uh, but then when Cole took his cross-checking penalty, um, he had gotten really hit hard before that. I thought that was a clean hit. But, you know, just being able to handle that against some of the bigger, stronger teams in the West is definitely going to be a challenge for Perfetti, who, uh, when he's got room, when he's got some time and space, when he's got the puck, can be very, very deadly. So... Jets get two of a possible four back at home, couple days of practice, and then the Hall of Fame game will be all over it. Chris King, former Winnipeg Jet, now with the National Hockey League, going to join us to talk about both Timu and Teppo as we get ready for Thursday night. All right. Thank you to everyone. Dropped up huge numbers of likes today. We'll have an impromptu quick unboxing here in just a moment. But let's get to the cool bet lines. We've got Monday night football tonight. The Washington Commanders going up against the Philadelphia Eagles. Undefeated Eagles, 11-point favorites at home. And now I'm seeing you can actually get uh, over 42.5 at minus 109 right now. I'm on the over. And by the way, if you're with us on YouTube right now, head on over to the lock shop. I actually should put the, uh, I should put the link in our, uh, in our uh, chat. Dusty and I... Now have the YouTube channel set up for the lock shop. That's where all of our uh, of our content is going to be. Here is the uh, here's the link right there, folks. And uh, today's lock shop. Normally we do it before the show. Dusty was uh, 
Dusty was uh, traveling today, so we're going to get after it right away here coming up. And uh, if you can, click on that link, head over, and uh, make sure you hit the subscribe button, and uh, we'll get after it. Um, man, it's been a good run for yours truly right now, 26-14 and 14 against the spread on our best bets for the year. Hopefully we can keep that going tonight. I do like the commanders, and I do like the over tonight for this game. We'll get into some other picks and props a little bit later on. Full World Cup odds and betting available is uh, ready to go right now. We'll get into that a little later on this week. And as far as tonight in the National Hockey League, we have, what, uh, four games tonight. Islanders at Ottawa. Ottawa slight home dog at plus 104. The Kings plus 137 at the Flames, who snapped that losing streak against Winnipeg. Calgary minus 161. Hurricanes a big road favorite at minus 233. In Chicago, take on the Blackhawks. Blackhawks, big home dog, plus 195. In the final game of the night, Central Division battle, St. Louis Blues at the Colorado Avalanche. Avalanche, minus 185, and the Blues, plus 155. If you've never used CoolBet before, use the promo code WST on your first deposit. Give you a 100% bonus up to 200 bucks on that first deposit over at CoolBet. And do follow CoolBet Canada on Instagram and Twitter. I will be cranking out a ton of content with my buddy Jake Bowen Moss from Qatar beginning next weekend, uh, just as hopefully the Bombers are winning a third consecutive Grey Cup. I hard to believe that this is coming up this soon, man, and uh, be leaving on Saturday and hooking up with you from the Middle East next Monday on the program. Yeah, a lot of people asking who's going to do this show. Well, we're hoping that you can do it from Qatar I mean, hopefully the technology allows it. I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, we will. We're going to test it out. I've got and... a special converter, special converter to plug. Uh, oh, okay, good. To need plug a couple things of those. in. Going to be heading back to the bar tonight. One of my other buddies spent some time and uh, out there, and he's got another one for me. So uh, we'll do it. And I think we, you know, we'll probably maybe lean on a few of the other guys, maybe to come on a little bit more if there are time when I'm out. Give Remo a little company on the show, and. Um, as I say, I'll be cranking out a bunch of content. We'll be sending stuff back to here and hopefully joining on a pretty much regular basis. There'll be a couple days I probably won't be on the show live due to being at World Cup Games when we are on right now. Uh, but again, a lot of this is unknown. <laughs> so we're going to figure it out. First of all, the internet getting all that hooked up when I first get there and then everything else happening around it. All right. Yeah. Thank you again for everyone with the likes. Uh, over 300, so we will plan a suit show for this week. But, Remo, I said if we got to 250, we would do a little impromptu unboxing here. And we were going to need to do this somewhat quickly. But I went out to get a couple boxes of the new upper deck cards on the weekend, the latest hockey release. And at my local card shop, they had these surprise packs. There's four cards in here. I think they're all sort of noteworthy cards. Oh, and they're in in slabs. Slabs? So, he, so, so here we go. They are in slabs. I'm going to take them out from here. Here's the first card. Let's see. We can't look it at it before. A double du double signed. What? Manny Malhotra, Jody Shelley. Oh. Be a player signatures. That's, That's a great set. came out. Man, Manny Malhotra is amazing at faceoffs. Jody Shelley uh, is commentator with the Blue Jackets. Now, Man I believe he's Manitoban. Is there we are. All right, next card. What do we have here? Jersey card. This Islanders. Is a jersey card of Michael Grabner, former oh, Moose. Oh, Moose legend. And and Josh Bailey. Oh, he's pretty good go. too. Double jersey card for the New York Islanders. Interesting. All right. Let's go with this next one. This that, one is... That, that Manny Malhotra is the winner. So far. What's that? This is a numbered card. I can't... Marcus Johansson. Oh, he's pretty good. Upper deck exclusives numbered to 100. 45 out of 100 for Marcus Johansson. Nice. All right. And now, here we go. Fresh Threads. Jamie, Jamie ben. ben. Oh, he's having a great year. Jamie Ben. Well, he had that hat trick the other day. He didn't look too good against the Winnipeg Jets, but I was fine with that. So there you go. Upper deck. A little bit of an unboxing. I've got another one of these mystery packs. Okay. I got we'll some, some uh, fun with these later on. I got a couple of Tim Horton packs that I haven't that I bought from my son, and then he got distracted. 
never opened them, but I really bought them for me. So <laughs> yeah, no doubt. I love the fact you're going to be like, oh, I'm going to get Evan really into cards and just, you know, he knows that'll so he... be the excuse to say, hey, I got the Hockey it's... Superstars book, uh, like Hockey Superstars 1989 from my brother-in-law. And like, he knows uh, Mike Vernon and who else? Paul Coffey's in there. So he knows, he knows stuff. But before, before we move on, a couple uh, hockey notes has Patrick Line out three or four weeks with a sprained ankle. Guy can't catch a break. He's really battled health stuff, um, you know, since going to Columbus. Uh, Leafs put Jake Muzz in a long-term injury. I wonder if, what they're going to do now. They got some cap space to acquire a D. Uh, Mason Appleton, we didn't even talk about this. He got, was injured, got clotheslined. His stick got cut. It got caught in the camera hole. That looked really bad. So we'll have to wait and see what happens there. Uh, Jansen Harkins, he got hit in the face, too, with that breakout pass and didn't play yesterday. He put on the cage for the Saturday's game, so we'll have to yeah, see Yeah, actually, speaking of which, what we didn't mention was Mikey Essimont get, uh, yeah. getting into the lineup. Uh, you know, recall. I, I, listen, I really like his game. He is, uh, he he gets after it. He gets into the spot. The puck seems to find him, and um, I don't mind him at all as a depth option for the Winnipeg Jets right now. Um, all right, gang, we got to get this podcast up. Don't forget, check the description. If you haven't filled out your entry for the Little Brown Jug Grey Cup Party Contest, you just got to fill out that 20-second survey. Help the boys out here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Again, that's in the subscription, or check out our Twitter or Instagram for the link. Um, big thanks to Jeff Hamilton. Thanks to Troy Westwood and, of course, Rob Gale. World Cup coming up. Great Cup this week is going to be bananas here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. And, of course, a huge, very special night for Jet fans when Tamu Solani and Teppo Newman go into the Jets Hall of Fame. That is coming up later on this week as well. We'll have the latest on the Jets back on the practice ice tomorrow. Speaking of the ice, Connor Bedard coming into town later on this week as the ice continue rolling. We'll get to that as well. The latest on the Jets and everything surrounding the Bombers' third consecutive trip to the Grey Cup. Big thanks to all the sponsors that make this show happen. Thanks to the huge turnout today live on YouTube. Thanks to everyone listening on the podcast at home. Join us tomorrow live, 1 p.m. right here, live on YouTube, for more Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily as Grey Cup Week is on and the Bombers are back. Have a great night, everyone. Oh, my God! Oh! Oh! Shut it down! Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.